Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah all praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidil anbiya wal mursalin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam peace and blessings salutations be upon the leader of the messengers and prophets our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Alhamdulillah we have gathered here today to remember the honorable Shaykh Muhaddithul Haramain Muhaddithul Hijaz a Shaykh a Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi bin Abbas bin Abdul Aziz al Maliki al Idrisi al Hassani al Makki rahimahullah ta'ala Very briefly inshallah um, the Shaykh rahimahullah was born in 1367 Hijri Different reports mention different dates but 1367 Hijri rahimahullah ta'ala and passed away on the Fajr of the Friday of the 15th of Ramadan 1425 which corresponds to 2004 Rahimahullah Ta'ala so it's been subhanallah you know, 17 18 years since the passing of the Shaykh the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala was a huge benefactor um, to the world to the Ummah of the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his funeral was one of the biggest funerals that was ever witnessed it's mentioned 200,000 people attended his funeral in Makkah al-Mukarramah from Masjid al-Haram to Maqbarat al-Mu'alla or what we call Jannat al-Mu'alla there was a standstill traffic for two consecutive hours the amount of people that attended his funeral rahimahullah ta'ala so I don't want to jump the gun we alhamdulillah have a connection with the shaykh and we want to learn more about the shaykh and by the remembrance of the righteous the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends so inshallah without further ado i'll hand it over to uh, imam muhammad mubashir iqbal hafizahullah ta'ala a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam What great fortune it is, Alhamdulillah uh, It's a Saturday And uh, we're here remembering Salihin And uh, especially that Salih individual uh, By the name of Muhammad bin Alabi al-Maliki al-Makki rahimahullah ta'ala Someone from the family of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, One of the greatest muhaddithin and uh, hadith scholars of Makkah al-Mukarramah And can you imagine being one of the greatest muhaddithin of Makkah imagine the caliber of scholars that exists in Makkah uh, at the heart of uh, you know the haram and uh, where the holy kaaba is and where the grave say the khatija is and where the prophet sallallahu was born uh, for centuries there have been great caliber of ulama and uh, you know a uh, sheikh sayyid uh, muhammad bin alabi uh, f- hails from that part of the world and he's considered as one of the greatest muhaddithin of his time and of his era so we're very lucky to be uh, sitting here today and those of you who are viewing online uh, the families who are also uh, present here as well uh, at uh, central jami moskum gold sharif uh, so a uh, form and but what what is more fortunate than that or an increased fortune you could say is that we are celebrating this uh, remembrance uh, coinciding with the passing of uh, of the sheikh in the islamic calendar as well so tonight after maghrib salatul maghrib will be the 15th of ramadan so 15th of ramadan is when the sheikh passed away so we're remembering him in not only ramadan not only we're taking our weekend and sp- spending time to remember him but it's coinciding with the islamic day as well uh, added fortune to that is that we're also in the presence of some of his family as well rahimahullah ta'ala uh, alhamdulillah i'm going to just introduce uh, our, our guest who we are honored to have today and the brothers who have come uh, from cambridgeshire today inshallah and uh, f- without further ado we're going to move on it's not going to be a speech based uh, session today uh, i think what they call it now online is podcast right is that what they call it <laughs> so it's a kind of a podcast or kind of an interview or just a bit of a chit chat we're gonna we're gonna talk and ask questions inshallah and uh, probe the uh, sheikh inshallah and ask him about Sayyid muhammad and we're, we're gonna have a good time inshallah as we're just talking and remembering the salihin and watch how allah's watch how you feel the mercy of allah inshallah as well in this gathering and uh, those who are online as well uh, they're a part of this uh, beautiful remembrance as well and the families who are here as well uh, so with me uh, today and with us today 
uh, here at Central Jamia Mosque Gold Sharif is none other than uh, my beautiful friend, great friend, uh, Sayyid Ma'an al Dabbagh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. Uh, Sayyid, uh, Sayyid Ma'an is uh, originally from Saudi Arabia and particularly from Jeddah. His family, his particular family, is originally from Madinatul Munawwara. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, we have the Ahlul Madina who are with us today, Alhamdulillah. Uh, currently he's residing in Cambridge um, and uh, he is working currently on his PhD. And his PhD revolves around the ulama of the Haramain of Makkah, Mukarramah and Madinat al Munawwara from the 17th and the 18th centuries. We have a lot of great, um, huge, influential ulama scholars in that part of the world at that time. So the fact that we have some research uh, of scholars in that regard, in that period in time, from that part of, a, of the world, uh, is a great sarmaya and treasure for us. And uh, Sayyid Ma'an is, uh, uh, is uh, facilitating uh, the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu in that, and uh, the community in that, by writing on this and taking time out. Um, the Shaykh, uh, Shaykh uh, Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, as you know, he had many children. And uh, he had sons, he had girls, he had more girls than sons. May Allah preserve all of them. And Alhamdulillah, Sayyid Ma'an is not only related to Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi in the sense that uh, he's, a, he's a Dabbaghi. Uh, the Dabbaghi family are actually Sadat from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi, uh, his family lineage is also Dabbaghi as well. So in terms of him being a Sayyid, uh, Sayyid Muhammad, the family he, uh, 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 he the family line uh, go, uh, is the Baghi as well. So he's also related to the Sheikh in that they f they're from Sadat, from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi but also very closely related because of the lines and the and the the, the, the chains of, uh, of 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 Aba and Ajdad that they come from as well. But not only that, but he's also uh, the son-in-law of Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al Maliki as well. Uh, he has the great fortune of being uh, directly related into the family, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And uh, Sayyid Ma'an, mashallah, uh, is a great friend and very uh, always honored to speak with him and uh, sit with him and talk with him. Uh, he's continuing that family lineage, that legacy, meaning these are, that's, that family has a legacy. And uh, that legacy is a huge legacy. And uh, in their own ways, uh, generally speaking, they're continuing that legacy um, of... Uh, you know, uh, wanting to further the message of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam and to sing the praises of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Just on this point, actually, I want to mention something, uh, and then I'm going to pass it over uh, to Ma'an straight away, inshallah. Um, one of our grand teachers, uh, Ma'an, um, they used to say they 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 have a university in Pakistan, and now it's an accredited university, so they would teach the Islamic sciences there. The logo of the university uh, is a picture of the green dome. And beneath it, it says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ so Somebody asked the Shaykh, they said, uh, why is it that you've chosen from all the ayat, 6,000 plus ayat of the Qur'an, why this ayah? And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We raised for you your remembrance, so we made it our life's purpose. <laughs> so that's the purpose of, the, of, the, of, of that family uh, in that part of the world. And without a doubt, that um, influence um, has spread in all members of the family and all of them in their own ways. Uh, generally speaking, uh, 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 are doing just that, and not only that, but they're also they have siyada as well, meaning they they hail from that family as well, inshallah. So, without further ado, um, we welcome you formally, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, uh, Sayyid Ma'an, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna move straight into it, inshallah. So, we're gonna start with the first question, inshallah. Um, we've found that with the Sayyid Muhammad, um, there's in 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 uh, usually he's known as Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi. Uh, we've also found in some of his books, he actually, when he names himself, he names himself as Muhammad Hassan. So can you just clarify that? Is it Muhammad Hassan or Muhammad? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-musarin sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. If you allow me just first to, to start by thanking you uh, and the mosque for holding such a great gathering to remember Sayyid Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Ali. And um, uh, as you said, Sayyidi, um, by remembering them, actually, we are drawing down mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, if you don't mind, if we can just start by reading Fatiha for the Sayyid, and then you continue. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. To 
Hopefully, man, or inshallah, our mashaykh. Yeah, um, I think it's that we have that tradition in the um, in the Muslim world, which is to uh, to have a like a more one name. Uh, and just so one mentioned, f- for example, in the Hijaz as a tradition, we used to have uh, that tradition. Any boy, when he's born, they will name him either Muhammad or Ahmed for the first week because it's Sunnah to name the boy on the um, uh, after on the seventh day. So they were known for the blessing of the name. And if it was a, a, a daughter, then Fatima. And then probably they would change it, but for the blessings of, uh, of the name. So um, I think choosing more than one name uh, for the person was quite uh, common, mm-hmm. and it was the same. So his actual name is Muhammad al-Hassan, yes? Mm-hmm. But then um, after a while, there was um, uh, like a, a law in Saudi to remove any kind of ism murakab and to keep only one name. Okay. So that's why then it became Muhammad. So now we don't have in Saudi any kind of uh, murakab name. We don't. Okay. By law, it's uh, it's a valid, yeah. Okay. yeah we, um, so, <coughs> you know, um, <coughs> Mullah Anisab introduced the Sheikh and he mentioned uh, at the end of his name, Al-Idrisi, mm. amongst other titles, Al-Maliki, Al-Makki, etc. Um, we were doing a bit of uh, reading um, and um, we, we found that uh, this is in reference to Sayyid Idris Al-Azhar. No. No. Uh, ibn al-Akbar, no. Ibn Abdullah al-Kamil, Ibn Hassan al-Muthanna, Ibn Hassan al-Sibt. No. So this is the chain of the line that goes through. So yes. he's uh, Idrisi. And we know that the Idrisis obviously originate from North Africa. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, w- at what point was it that the, the family, you could say, migrated from th- North Africa into Mecca and the into Hijaz? Mecca again. So different or- originally, they are from Hijaz. So Sayyidina Idris al-Akbar, yes. Ibn Abdullah, um, he migrated after Ma'arakat uh, Fakh when a great, not great, um, actually a very tough massacre of people of Ahlul Bayt happened toward the last quarter of the second Hijri century. So he migrated uh, to North Africa and he founded the Idrisi um, uh, state there. Uh, and then they stayed um, the family between Morocco and uh, Al Andalus for quite a few centuries. And they came back around s- before almost like six c- centuries. So Sayyid Muhammad family came back almost six centuries back to, to Hijaz again. You mentioned that point, we were just talking about that earlier on, that if you look at Sayyid Muhammad, uh, you feel glimpses of uh, yeah, Fez yeah. and Morocco. And yes, you yes, mentioned that yes. actually Sayyid Mosul, Alawi, yeah. Sayyid, Alawi. Sayyid Alawi, it's quite clear. Uh, when you look at his uh, yeah, pictures, especially with the kuhul. Yes. I mean, it's, it's quite clear as a, as a, as a Moroccan Sayyid yeah, Moroccan. from first, exa- yeah. yani, subhanAllah, yeah. Um, mashallah, um, with the Shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, Sayyid Muhammad, his honorable father, Sheikh Alawi, was also, you know, had a seat, a mudarris in yeah. Masjid al-Haram, and his honor- honorable grandfather. How far back did this uh, tradition of uh, teaching you know, hadith and uloom, because it's not necessary that, you know, the, there must have been somebody within the lineage who came this way. But how uh, far back in the ancestry of the Shaykh is this? Yeah, it's um, um, it's one of the um, known families of scholarly tradition for about five or six centuries back. Sure. So all his fathers and gran- grandfathers, they were muftis, Qadis and Imams of um, of uh, Haram or some and in some areas, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, mashallah, it's a long tradition and heritage. And even with even with the sh- even with the Sheikh Sheikh Mu- Sayyid Muhammad, um, we were actually reading that um, uh, the tradition obviously then carried on, and he imbibed that tradition most definitely. But what was something quite amazing uh, we were actually reading was that before he actually reached uh, bulugh and puberty, his father already made him a form of a teacher, and uh, he would send. Uh, students to him so students would come to Sayyid uh, Alawi to study with the, f- the, the the father and he would send them to the son <laughs> and the son was not even uh, maybe 8, 9, 10 years old yeah, at yeah. that time he used to teach at very early age and even by the way Sayyid Alawi Sayyid Alawi got an ijazah to teach in the haram uh, in the haram while he was uh, 19 Nice. So he was given an ijazah to teach in the haram, Sayyid Alawi ibn Abbas. Mashallah. And Sayyid Muhammad, uh, yes, his father used to send students to study um, with him. Um, and then definitely he inherited after that the place of his father, 
-hmm. when Sayyid Alawi passed away in 1971. MashaAllah. Uh, so uh, all the schol great scholars of Mecca, and this is kind of a tradition we have in Hijaz, all the great scholars of Mecca, including Sheikh Hassan Mashat, Sheikh Muhammad Nur Saif, and many other great scholars, they come together and they kind of assigned him in his the chair of his father. And they attended the first lesson. And it was uh, on just the fourth day af after the death of Sayyidina Alawi. So after the Aza, three days, and then the fourth immediately, there was a death in al fiyat ibn Malik. And they, the great scholars of Mecca attended with him. MashaAllah. Uh, uh, to give him, you know, the support. To give the and support. The and yeah, and the authority. And give him that acceptance yeah. that he is uh, rightfully the heir of, of his father. But just going back to his father then, um, before we move to Sayyid Muhammad, um, tell us a bit about Sayyid Muhammad Alawi. Uh, Sayyid Muhammad Alawi, Sayyid Alawi, the father. Because, uh, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what, from what angle we're looking at, because uh, one is that he's Sayyid Muhammad uh, Alawi, the, the father. Uh, he, is, uh, he is around in the time of the Ottoman decline. So uh, that's that period in which uh, Sayyid Alawi is in. And not only that, but there's huge heavyweight scholars in that period. So I, I, I'll just mention some of those uh, ulama uh, for y your guys' reference as well. We have like uh, Sheikh Sayyid Zaini Dahlan in that period. We have the likes of Sheikh Saleh Al Kamal. We have uh, Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Babu Sayl, Rahimullah. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Sayyid Ismail Khalil. We have the brother of Ismail Khalil, who is Sayyid Mustafa. We have uh, Abu Khair Al Mirdad. We have the likes of Abdullah ibn Sadiq ibn uh, Abbas, the Mufti of the Hanafiya. Uh, we have Hamid Ahmed Muhammad Al Jaddawi. And uh, that's also in the period when uh, the Sharif of Mecca is an Ottoman. So uh, his name was actually Ali Pasha. Mm. So we've got an Ottoman uh, Pasha. It is obviously the Ottoman decline period. And we've got heavyweights like this who are around. And the reason why we have this knowledge of these heavyweights and these great scholars is because our ulama and mashayikh from the subcontinent, because we, uh, we uh, many of us are South Asian, uh, um, our South Asian ulama met and rubbed shoulders with these ulama. So when Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, rahimahullah, other ulama, when they traveled to Hijaz, they sat and met and spoke and spent time with these ulama and uh, benefited from each other in many ways. Um, so Sayyid Alawi is in that period. So can you tell us a bit about Sayyid Alawi? Uh, who was he? Where was? Uh, what was his life's mission, generally speaking? And uh, what was his uh, status as a, as a scholar in Makkah al-Mukarramah? Uh, Sayyid Ali Rahmatullah Ali, he was definitely kind of the uh, one of the great scholars of Mecca. He was considered like the face of Mecca in a sense. And uh, again, um, he was from the great, so he inherited uh, the teaching position of um, his uh, his fathers. And uh, he was with Sheikh Hassan Mashat, um, like the imams of, of Maliki at, at that time, and Sheikh Muhammad Nur Saif. Um, and I think one of the interesting thing about him, again, he was a great muhaddith, he was a great faqih, a great usuli. I mean, a full rounded scholar, as we know, our greatest scholars who used to teach uh, all the, uh, the ulum. And um, um, he was teaching again in the Haram, very close to Bab Salam. Uh, and after that, after finishing teaching in the Haram, most of his drus were in the evening. He used to continue teaching also at, at home for, uh, um, you know, kind of for the private students. And he was definitely also the, the Mufti of, uh, of Malikis. And he had a very important social role for, you know, kind of solving resolutions and problems among uh, people of Mecca and even family issues. Mm -hmm. And he was the main also uh, one who was conducting actually most of the um, marriage contracts in Mecca. So he's the famous kind of uh, um, uh, scholar of that time. Uh, I think one of the differences, if we want, because probably people, they don't know a lot about Sayyid Alawi. Sayyid Alawi was uh, a person who um, didn't have any conflict with, uh, with the opposing sects in a way. He was always trying to do things in a very... Uh, gentle way and he was quite funny by the way Sayyid Ali yeah, so uh, Sayyid Muhammad also was Sayyid Ali once somebody came to him in the haram and uh, he wanted to ask him for a fatwa and that person divorced his wife 100 times <laughs> he said yeah Sayyid Ali I divorced my wife 100 times and I want to get it back he said 
immediately he said, well, I will take on my shoulder 97 divorces. There is only three. Look at the sheikh here. He went, why is because anything above three <laughs> means nothing. So <laughs> he will take, I will take the burden of 97 divorces. There is only three left. Please look at the sheikh here and listen to another, another person. So Sayyid Ali was, and he, the way he used to, uh, again, to teach, and one of the stories, again, one of the people tried to, um, uh, again, to argue with him. He was mentioning, he said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu. Then he said, yeah, Shaykh, this is bid'ah and uh, haram and uh, like shirk. He said, okay, after a while, he said, okay, we want to read a few verses from the Quran. He said, Bismillah. So Sayyid Ali started to read. Said, I'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim, bara'atu min Allahi thumma rasoolihi. Said, yeah, Shaykh, this is haram. How come? It is wa rasooli. You said, we can't say Allah and Rasul. So, <laughs> <laughs> so immediately he cited a verse from the Quran to support. So he was, he was a very... Very um, interesting personality, how he used to, to teach people and to engage with others. And what's quite interesting is, um, mm -hmm. as somebody who met uh, Sayyid uh, Al-Alawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, was uh, the great Shaykh Diyauddin Al-Madani, who was the Khalifa Mujaz of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, rahimahullah, they, would, they, they met, they had love for one another, mashallah. So we, we see that again, uh, this uh, tradition, uh, the, all the int traditions are intertwined. And the mashrab and the, the, the sauce is one. And even by the way, if we want to speak a little bit earlier, you know, um, as Sayyid Muhammad al Ma'asum, the son of Sidi Ahmad al Sirhindi, yeah. by the way, he lived in Hijaz for a while. Mashallah. He migrated to Hijaz. And through that, many of the, uh, yeah, the Mujaddidi line basically um, um, came to Hijaz and become really prominent. Mashallah. So, subhanAllah, it was a, a very interesting uh, yeah, area. MashaAllah. So, that was a bit about um, the Honorable Father of Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Uh, as we were preparing for uh, today, something stood out for us. Um, our community, we're mainly South Asians, Pakistan, Hindustan, Bangladesh. And we have a deep connection with Sultan al Awliya, Sayyidina Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, mm. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. We see his name anywhere, and it just, you know, our heart <laughs> opens up. Uh, so we read that the Honorable Mother of Sayyid Muhammad bin Maliki Rahimahullah, Sayyida Fatima, she is Baghdadiya yeah. from Baghdad, but also she is from the lineage of Sayyidina Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani Rahimahullah. So Sayyid Muhammad from his Honorable Mother is a descendant of Sayyidina Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani. So I want to with this also ask, um, prior to this we had a little discussion about the connection of Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi with Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So, there's a story you wanted to mention. So, if you could mention that and enlighten no, us. If you want to mention the story, please, please. So we want to hear it from you, inshallah. No, no, please, please go on. You want me to mention yeah, it? Yeah, please. With your permission. Astaghfirullah, yes, please. <laughs> um, so, we read that Sayyid Muhammad, uh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in his youth, he lost uh, power in his right hand. So he wasn't able to utilize his right hand. They went to the doctors, many doctors in the east and the west, and they couldn't come to a cure. So he was actually paralyzed his right hand from a young age. Now for a person of that caliber, from that family of dars, tadris, ta'alim, ta'allum, uh, ta'lif, that's very difficult. The Shaykh after that, um, he went to the Ashab al-Badr, to the uh, where the Shuhada of Badr are buried uh, for the Ziyarah, then Dua there went to Medina to Munawwara, Zadah Allah Sharaf and Ta'zima, presented his salam in the Ziyarah. At that point, he was given Ishara to travel to Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani in Baghdad and that he would receive his ilaj, his cure from there. Subhanallah. But at that point, uh, there was war taking place in Iraq. So it's a bit difficult for him to <coughs> travel. So he made intention he'll travel in secret without telling any of the family members. Mm -hmm. He'll just travel, go, do ziyara, and return without anybody knowing. The day of his uh, departure, he's about to leave his home, and his honorable wife, uh, Sayyida Um Ahmed, uh, she came, and she says to him on the day that he's leaving, I had a dream that you're leaving and traveling to Baghdad. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, I had a dream, and in my dream, there was a young man who gave me a card, and, on the, and then when he gave me that card, he said to me, this is the invitation of Sayyiduna Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani for Sayyid Muhammad al-Makki. And give this to him. And on the card, she mentioned this to him and she said, on the card, it said the name Tariq. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, your host is Tariq. 
So she already was given this, uh, you know, Bashara. So the Shaykh left, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, uh, for Baghdad. When he arrived in Baghdad, I'm cutting long story short, he entered the Blessed Mazar, the mausoleum, the resting place of Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. But there was such a huge, you know, uh, number of people, a rush, he was unable to enter. As he is waiting to enter, a man comes to him and the man says to him, you come with me, I will look after you and then we'll come later when the rush is less. So the man takes the Shaykh to the hotel and the Shaykh says, I didn't even ask him who he was and he didn't ask me who I am. We just carried on. <laughs> uh, the next day he took me to the, um, for the ziyara of Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. I went, done ziyara, um, you know, ma uh, uh, made my uh, pledges. And then after that, we come back, we have breakfast. And now we're coming back, he's going to take me back to the airport. Then I ask him, uh, what's your name? And he says, my name is Tariq. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Tariq. And I'm a, a soldier from Mosul. And I had a dream. And Sayyiduna Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani came to me in my dream and said to me, my guest from Mecca is coming. You will host him. <laughs> you will host him. And then they parted ways. And Sayyid Muhammad, rahimahullah ta'ala, at that point, the feeling came back into his hand and he was able to use his right hand again. <laughs> By the barakah of... Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Thank you for allowing me to no, mention that. It's a pleasure. It's a huge honor, mashallah. Um, man, just on this point, um, <coughs> because uh, we're talking about the link between uh, Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani and uh, Sayyid Muhammad, and uh, the fact that his f family lineage hails from there, from his mother's side. What was his relationship to his mother? Because we know that children are in the laps of their mothers and the tarbiyah comes from there. What, what, what to say about Sayyidina Fatima, Rahimahullah? Oh, subhanAllah, the relationship was uh, really interesting um, and um, probably not as we would imagine. Um, I mean, out of sometimes the, the type of respect we have toward our parents, which is to be very formal and very, it's the opposite with Sayyid Muhammad. <laughs> he was very respectful, but also he was also usually um, uh, have, you know, funny things with his mom and... Uh, and she used definitely to, to love him. Uh, and she used always to, to, to say to Sayyid Muhammad, you know, Anta ladi lam tukhlaq mithluha fil bilad. He said, nobody was created like you to him. Um, so Sayyid Muhammad definitely, yes, was uh, very attached. And she used to live with them when uh, Sayyid Alawi passed away, with Sayyid Muhammad, rahimahullah. So she was like the blessing of, uh, of the house. And one, whenever Sayyid Muhammad used to have um, guests to host from different and you know sometimes they would come as families and then they would receive the guest um, of f for, for the female sides and they will honor the guests and they will basically make dua uh, with them and uh, but whatever definitely uh, before doing any things and major steps definitely he will you know get the barakah of uh, his mom and ask for her dua and uh, always he used to um, going up and down uh, to the Druze, he would pass by his mom and you know stay a little bit at least with her and uh, Rahimahullah. Yeah, it was it was an interesting also we connection. Were reading that uh, he used to, we were actually reading that he used to call his mom twice a day, Rahimahullah, <laughs> 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 uh, and um, uh, that at one point I think he had a a job uh, as a lecturer. He was given a job as a lecturer in the Emirates. Uh, but he didn't take it because he wanted to stay uh, with his mother. Yeah, even he, he was offered to be a minister. Mm -hmm. okay. He was offered to be a minister. When uh, there was a bit of uh, attention and there was concern about his own safety mm -hmm. um, in Mecca because he received some life-threatening uh, kind of things. Uh, and then he was offered actually even to be ministers in several places, but definitely in the UAE. But he said that, I want to, to be in Mecca. Nobody leave Mecca for anything else. And he wanted to continue yeah, to be in Mecca. SubhanAllah. Um, Shaykh, can we move on, inshallah, and speak about uh, <coughs> the Shaykh's studies? So if you could tell us a bit about the early years of the studies of uh, Sayyid Muhammad, rahimahullah ta'ala, yeah. his studies from the early age. Yeah, uh, Sayyid, rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, you know, he was born very close to Bab al-Salam in Mecca at which his father used to teach. But outside of 
Bab al-Salam, and it's the area of Mas'a. I'm not sure if you know, Mas'a, uh, the place of Sa'i, was actually a place of, uh, it was a market, basically. And around that area, there was the main book market of Mecca. So it, it is very close to Haram, very close to the book market, main book market of Mecca. His father was a great scholar. So from the early beginning, he's definitely, he started by memorizing the Quran and then studying with his father. And then his father used to send him or to ask Mashaykh to come and teach him or send him to, mm -hmm. to the Mashaykh. And um, he excelled in a way that Sheikh Hassan Mashat, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi, the Sheikh of the Malikiyas, um, he was so proud of Sayyid Muhammad. So he told Sayyid Alawi, Hada far'un faqa aslahu. So this is a branch that excelled and kind of uh, surpasses his, his uh, uh, father and grandfather. Uh, so scholars of Mecca noticed that kind of uh, the smart, how smart he was and how, how eager he was uh, in, in getting knowledge. So they gave him a special attention. So even scholars of Mecca, other than Sayyid Alawi, gave him very special attention. And uh, the way he just was keeping his time and his attachment to the knowledge was uh, quite clear. He used to spend day and nights other than going and studying with the Mashaykh and serving the Mashaykh to learn from them also in terms of uh, reading. At the same time, he attended an official school. We had a school in Mecca, a famous school called Madrasa al Falah. Mm. So it's like the official uh, madrasa uh, at which also gr the greatest scholars of Mecca used to teach, among them Sayyid Alawi and Sheikh Hassan Mashal. So they used to teach in the Haram and use in Madrasa al Falah too. Uh, and then he continued uh, his study there, uh, especially with the Sheikh Muhammad uh, Nur Saif, until he uh, graduated after that. And um, um, before going to Al-Azhar, uh, Sayyid Alawi again asked few of the Mashaykh to focus with him so that he can immediately go into like postgraduate studies. Rahimahullah mm Ta'ala. -hmm. Uh, um, um, and then he studied definitely in the Al-Azhar. And after that, he wanted to study in, uh, in Pakistan, by the way. And uh, he spent his honeymoon in Pakistan. <laughs> to study. So he took his wife to Pakistan <laughs> to study so he could combine both together. So subhanAllah, all his life is connected to subhanAllah. And uh, we're actually reading his thesis in Azhar was on Al Muwatta wa Inayatul Ummat al Islamiya Bihi. Wa Inayatul Ummat al Islamiya Bihi. And uh, it's quite interesting because he also. After graduating, when he went to Azhar, uh, he studied in Usuluddin as well uh, and did Hadith studies there. Yeah. So that was up to the PhD level, Alhamdulillah. Which is quite interesting because um, uh, even though he's from Makkah al Mukarramah, and obviously he's, uh, um, he's, uh, he's got great scholars uh, who are in Makkah al Mukarramah, he's obviously benefited from them as well. But it's uh, quite interesting to see that even being a Makkah scholar, he recognizes Azhar. Okay. as being a markaz for Ahlul Sunnah and for Islam generally, uh, which is something quite important. I mean, it's, uh, Azhar is our 1,000 plus year tradition uh, of education and learning. And uh, even today, you know, uh, Azhar is, you know, something really special. And uh, we're actually very fortunate. I was telling uh, um, Sayyid Ma'an that we have the Imam of the Azhar Mosque, which was originally the university here staying with us uh, in uh, our complex alhamdulillah but what's interesting as well they mentioned that um, when ulama would come f uh, to makkah and, and uh, al munawwara uh, makkah al mukarramah madinah al munawwara uh, they actually mentioned that they used to uh, he would benefit from them as well no doubt. so because it was a markaz uh, these two places were obviously center points for the whole muslim world so uh, you could imagine that he's also got his own t personal teachers yes but he's got you know, anyone who's coming into Makkah al-Mukarramah, he's taking a Sanid from them and benefiting from them. And, you know, so you could imagine that, the, you know, and somebody who's like Sayyid Muhammad, um, who's like, oh, he's, pr he's pretty much a prince of uh, Makkah al-Mukarramah. Yes. He's from a Sayyid family. And, but, you know, his, uh, what we learn about him is his inkisari and his humility, that even despite having the greatest scholars there in Makkah al-Mukarramah, him being from a Sayyid family, being from a tradition, yet he's taking a Sanid 
from other from other ulama and he's benefiting from their traditions and taking from them. I was watching a video when he went to the ulama of Damascus mm. and uh, one of the, I think the sahib bayt mm. the one who was the host, he said, uh, uh, Sayyid, give us your ijazat. Mm. And he goes, Astaghfirullah, how can I give ijazat? And there's great scholars sitting beside him. Mm. There's Ramadan Bhuti sitting there and you have Ahmad Habbal sitting there and Abdul Razak Halabi and others. Then he smiles and he says, it was an opportunity for him. He said, <laughs> if they all give me the asanid, <laughs> then I'll give my asanid as well. <laughs> <laughs> so Allah. amongst them we are very lucky because we had uh, you know um, we were actually reading that um, uh, the great Abdul Alim Siddiqui rahimullah he was the father of Shah bin Nurani um, who spread Islam in uh, Mauritania South Africa all these places he was the the disciple of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan he also met with Sayyid Muhammad and uh, he gave his ijazat to Sayyid Muhammad we have Diauddin uh, Al Madani uh, who was uh, from the subcontinent as well he's buried inside Baqi uh, he also met with Sayyid Muhammad gave ijazat to him as well and also Mustafa Rida Khan Rahimullah and the son of Imam Ahmad Rida they met with uh, Sayyid Muhammad and uh, they gave ijazat as well so, and he travelled to many scholars by the way I mean mm. and this is you know this is the kind of uh, the um, the norm of many of the scholars they start by their own scholars of the city or the region they are in, and then they start to travel extensively. And Sayyid Muhammad basically, uh, as I said, he went to the subcontinent, he went to Morocco, he went to Syria to study with scholars and to get a Sanid uh, from, from them. So he had more than 300 sheikh. Just to give you, a, to put things into perspective, his students, he's now probably the, the muhaddith of Mecca, Sayyid uh, Nabil al-Ghamri, Hafizahullah ta'ala. He published the Asanid of the Sayyid Rahmatullah Ta'ala in three volumes. Wow. Yeah. So Asanid of Sayyid Muhammad in three volumes. Only Asanid of Sayyid Muhammad in three volumes. So he had a really extensive uh, Isnad. Um, Do you want to just tell them about the, what, what the books behind it? Okay, <laughs> mashallah. Um, so the Shaykh has written over 200 books. Some are printed, some are still in manuscript form. Um, we have, uh, mashallah, behind our honorable mm -hmm. guest, a whole collection of 77 books that uh, Sayyid Muhammad bin Malik, uh, Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, wrote. Can you see that? So these are the, the, his honorable son, Sayyid Ahmed, had these all printed recently. So they're all printed by the same publication, 77 of them, uh, mashallah, all in different disciplines. Um, amazing works, amazing works. <laughs> and um, with that, there are a lot of hadith works. So that leads me to my next question. Sayyid Muhammad, rahimahullah ta'ala, was the muhadith, the hadith scholar. Why was he known as the muhadith? What was his relationship like with ilmul hadith? Hmm. Hmm. Um, definitely, it started from, uh, in, in general, Hijaz is a center of hadith. So even it's kind of the main discipline in the Hijaz. And that definitely goes back to, you know, early... Uh, years, so he was he was influenced by his father and by his scholars, because also um, we had great muhaddithin at his time at the level of his teachers like Sheikh Muhammad Yasin Al Fadani, for example, who were the musnidin of the whole world. So that influenced him, and then when he studied his PhD too, um, when he focused on Al Muwatta, also because he's a Maliki. Also, he, he has that special link to Muwatta of Imam Malik. And he wrote different studies about the Muwatta, by the way, not only the PhD. Okay, not, not and the PhD only. Not, not the PhD Imam only, yes. And about Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, also he, he wrote uh, a study about him. And by the way, he, he kind of specialized in hadith in an early stage. Also, his PhD, he got it when he was 25. And it was something at that time in the Azhar to have a PhD at 25. The, at 25. Like, it's um, when he finished, no, uh, late late 60s, late 60s, late 60s yeah. So generation. at that time, Abu still can, Abu, exactly, um, and Hassanin Makhlouf and Salih uh, al-Ja'fari uh, and all these scholars, mm -hmm. Sheikh Salih rahimahullah ta'ala. So it wasn't that easy to get, so he got that. Um, uh, and then his basically when he specialized in hadith, as I said, he start by taking all the asanid of the local scholars and then he started to um, uh, disseminate that and, and uh, sorry to take the Asanid of the whole world and one of the main points why he had the connection with Hadith two things one of them he mentioned it in one of his uh, introduction of one of the books now uh, I don't remember he said which book yani? he said uh, فَكَلَامُ سَيِّدِ الْبَشَرِ هُوَ سَيِّدُ كَلَامُ الْبَشَرِ 
كلام سيد البشر هو سيد كلام البشر he want to focus on hadith because the words of the master of the universe is kind of the master of word of the whole universe <laughs> Well, yeah, this is one thing. And the other thing he mentioned, one of his main intentions, also he mentioned that in some of the books, because of it is related to the beloved, alayhi salatu wasalam. Whenever he read or narrate, he will send salawat and salutations. So to mention uh, the, the name of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and to serve his sunnah, especially at the time at which people were little bit concerned about the attachment and the connection Of, with the Prophet ﷺ due to, you know, some of the extremist views that we had. And also, unfortunately, those who were known as a bit of extreme people, they were the people of Hadith. So he wanted to prove again that the people of Sunnah are people of Hadith and they are well grounded in Hadith and very, very strong in Hadith and to support kind of the argument of the manhaj of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah through uh, the tradition of, uh, of Hadith. ما شاء الله ما شاء الله بارك الله um, سيد محمد رحمه الله تعالى uh, with this uh, he would spread hadith as well so we read that just in Indonesia within his honorable life he had established over 70 institutions um, which his students directly and indirectly surpassed 100,000 yeah. so how was he like with his students mm-hmm. that's You know, والله the relationship with the students and the people around him is it's just it's just really amazing. Um, and I think just to to give an indication, all the students or most of the students, especially the close one, would call him Abuya. Abuya means my father in our uh, Hijazi uh, dialect. So he used to provide shelter, food, everything for them, and. Especially with the students who came from, you know, from Indonesia and the Far East. You know, sometimes people would, um, unfortunately, they would not deal with them as with the locals, for example. And Sayyid did not accept that. So in one occasion, he was invited uh, and then he went uh, into the roof. We This is one of the tradition in Hijaz. Mm-hmm. They use the roof for gatherings and mawalid and even for marriages and whatever. So after a while, he said, uh, usually he, he woke with some, you know, some students would be with him, uh, 10, sometimes 15. So he asked, where are the students? They said, well, um, they kept them with the servants. And he said, he called the host and he said, uh, please, if you don't let them to come and sit with me, I will leave. So he, he didn't accept to deal with them in a way other than he... he usually wanted for them to receive the same level of uh, of uh, honor. And also at the beginning when he had uh, resident students, uh, sometimes people would uh, help him financially to support the students. He was, alhamdulillah, in a good condition, but for the students. After a while, uh, when he was able to do so, he did not accept anything from anyone for the students. He said, I will only spend on them from my own money. Wow. He didn't accept. Uh, when people sometimes came, they say this is sadaqah charity, he wouldn't accept to take it for the students. He would give them from his own as his students. And uh, I remember in the uh, early 80s, there was a trip for uh, him and his students. Usually he sent the student before. So they opened the house in Medina. And and unfortunately, uh, the bus had, uh, they had an accident and a few of them passed away. Rahimahumullah. So Sayyid subhanAllah was extremely, extremely had a huge grief because of that. And he did he was expecting everyone to give and to show condolences as if they were his own own sons, biologically. And if somebody did not come, he would kind of blame him. Why you didn't come? These are my sons. How come you don't come and to So it was a very uh, the other thing he about not only the resident students. As you know, uh, there are uh, there were people of Mecca and different parts of the Hijaz. They used to attend his durus from outside the madrasa. And the Sayyid used to teach every single day, basically. And on average, like from 300 to 500 people attend on daily basis. Yeah. So this is at his house. In the Haram, it used to be more, uh, a thousand. So um, he used to know 
For example, one of uh, our relatives, Sayyid Adnan al-Dabbaq, Hafizahullah, he used to attend only on Wednesdays. So he used to know, Sayyid Muhammad, the schedule of his students. If somebody didn't come, he would call and check him up. He would check about them. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? We haven't seen you. I hope you are fine and you, have, you are well. So he has very gestures, social, uh, really interesting ones. Before traveling, for example, if you want to travel to the UAE or whatever, Egypt, he would call the, his close students there. And he would tell them, I will come in that day. This is my schedule. Immediately after landing, going back to Mecca, he will call each one of them, thanking them. And Alhamdulillah, I have arrived and everything is good. And he would thank them for everything. Whenever anyone would give him a gift, even if it was really small gift, uh, from his students, or but you know, mainly many of the students would give him um, gifts. He had a, a small notebook and he would write the gift and who gave him the gift. So to return back a, a gift to keep record. So his connection with, uh, with the people in general and with students was really, really close connection as a real father. When they call him uh, Abuya or my father, it's, it's really for a reason. Because he used to um, live, even by the way, uh, at, at his early, when he had uh, his health was good, he used to wake them up for Qiyam al-Layl and do Qiyam al-Layl with them. And he had an etiquette. So, because, you know, peep, students, uh, were, they were uh, sleeping. Probably someone is not covered well or whatever. So he had a stick before going into the room. He will hit <laughs> the ground with a stick a few times so that they know that he's coming out of etiquette. Because he know they don't want him to see him in a kind of, you know, in a way which is so to help them also to represent themselves in the best possible way. So he, he was a real, real father for them. Uh, 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 we, were, we were reading in one place that um, <coughs> they said that he would spend just on his family and his students monthly 50,000 riyals. Probably so more. Probably more. More probably. Yes, for sure more. But that's sure that. More. Just to put that into perspective, that for according sure to more. modern day, um, the equivalent of that would be about ten thousand pounds. More, that's more, more than this. Yeah, more, than be more than this. Just to give you, um, during the Hajj period, when he usually many people want to visit him, so he opened the majlis and uh, on daily basis, more than thousand people, all of them they would eat. So, just this is what I witnessed. At least 100 full sheep will be slaughtered and being served to people during the Hajj season. At least. This is at least, at least, at least. And uh, other than the Sadaqah that we don't know about, other than the... Uh, they, they, they actually, we were reading as well that he used to have uh, three registers just for the poor and needy. <laughs> and uh, subhanAllah, yes, uh, and uh, there is a time. So every, usually on daily basis uh, during his dars, um, uh, he would sit after Isha. If people need anything, they, they would come and speak to him. But in Ramadan, there is no time. The door is open always. Anyone could come and ask for anything. And he was just so, so generous. I mean, no one would visit him without being fulfilled financially, spiritually, and, and uh, uh, even intellectually by having uh, gifts from his books and from... You can feel, subhanAllah, the generosity when you, when you, when you see him. So just, just moving on from there then, um, that's his students uh, who are not n biologically related, <coughs> related to him. What about those who were related to him biologically, his family? How was he with his family? Mm. How was he with you and your, you know, his children, his uh, wives, his, you know, his uh, grandchildren, etc.? Mm. What, was, what was he like at home? <laughs> subhanAllah, again, he was an interesting and um, very... Uh, uh, kind and also uh, in a way funny even with the, he liked to 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 uh, to make the gathering funny and to to make scholarly jokes in a sense and to to make people around him once i remember he called me uh, man come I said sit beside me i said you know he has a, a huge haiba <laughs> so when you tell him come so you don't know what's gonna happen he said i want to tell you a story bismillah sayyidi so he said, once uh, a famous merchant in Mecca, in, in Jeddah, sorry, called me and he had a, he, he, he was in a really tough situation, like a, 
do or die, something like that. And he asked his spiritual kind of support. So uh, he asked that person to have his private jet. He wanted to fly to Sayyidi Abu Hassan al-Shadili, Sayyid Muhammad. And he said, yes, definitely, bismillah. Uh, he provided the private jet, he was a very rich person. So Sayyid Muhammad called a few people and, and they went. And you know, he, he, he gave you context and when he explained things. And yeah, Sayyidi Mahan, this is happening and this is very, in a very nice way. So anyway, he said, and we went to Egypt. And then we went to the maqam of Sayyidi Abu Hassan al-Shadri. And we sat around the maqam. I asked the students to get their subha. And we started the dhikr. And he told me, then the land started to shake up. So I lowered my head and said, so this is not a karama, it was an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> like, Don't shake your hand, this is not a karama. <laughs> it was an earthquake. So he was very, um, subhanAllah, and you enjoy sitting with him. And you don't feel that this is the great wali and scholar when you see him in his nurse and his. The other interesting thing that he used to engage the family in authoring books. So by the way, his time with the family was a time of writing. So he used to ask his daughters to bring, uh, bring me that book from there, open that page and that chapter, read for me. He will engage them in, in that. And immediately after the Druze, uh, the first thing that he would ask about is, what did you learn? He will ask his daughters, what did you learn from the Ders? What do you have um, um, uh, from the test? What, what's, uh, what the things, if you have questions? And he will ask them to uh, sometimes to recite awrad for him. So, uh, so subhanAllah, it's, a, it's a just a, it's a full of kind of scholarly, uh, um, subhanAllah, family and living in, in a really interesting way. And he used to, to honor and love his daughters to a level that cannot be explained, so especially his daughters. Mm -hmm. um, subhanAllah, yeah. Um, and he used to honor them and respect them and uh, give them, especially from his, his own time and probably to pay more attention. For example, he would let uh, his sons like Sayyid Ahmed, Sayyid Abdullah study with other mashayikh. He would just bring mashayikh for his daughters, but also he would kind of by himself make sure that, yeah, to teach them. Because we, we were actually reading about this, you know, the, you, you mentioned what did you learn, the dars, etc. We were reading somewhat that whenever you'd speak to his children, he'd always <coughs> ask them, Ma ma karat. Mm. What, are you, what are you doing? What are you up to? And what are you reading? What are you reading? And yes. uh, th there was one story actually about Sayyid Ahmed that one day he went out with his family to a picnic. So imagine he's on a picnic with the family. So the, the Sayyid rings up and he asked him, he says, uh, How are you doing? What are you reading? And uh, Sayyid Ahmed said, I've got Sahih Muslim with me. Or Shara of Sahih Muslim commentary. And he was so happy and overjoyed that, you know, even despite him being out on this picnic with the family, he's constantly in, in, in reading. SubhanAllah, and because he was connected. My, my mother-in-law, um, she used to tell me uh, that, uh, Rahimahullah, Rahimahumullah, both of them. She used to tell me, even at the early time when, we, when they got married, she would sleep. And then probably while she's turning or she wants to you know to drink water or whatever she would wake up and see Sayyid Muhammad holding books and reading in the room um, and he used by the way to to um, to sleep only on on ground not on a bed yeah because he doesn't want to to sleep that too much and probably we will come when we mention his schedule we will go and, and this is uh, the, 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 uh, your mother-in-law who was the Sayyid's wife she passed away I believe just not long ago was it not? one and a half years ago one and a half years ago rahimahullah ta'ala yeah, may Allah raise her darajat in al-firdaus even in when he subhanAllah he used to travel in hotels he would ask them probably luxury hotels he would say if you can take out the bits because he want to he used to sleep on, on ground Inshallah. I think from the what you've mentioned of the the character um, of uh, Sayyid Muhammad Rahimahullah Taala, I think it's an important lesson for all of us. You know, as uh, the Ummah of the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyid Ahmad would describe his father. Read that he would embody the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I think it's um, a role model for us. Uh, you know, as teachers, as Imams, as people of the Deen. Uh, you know, dua people who invite towards the deen to adopt the character of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the way uh, Sayyidina Shaykh Muhammad rahimahullah ta'ala did inshallah uh, with um, 
the responsibilities of the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala, we see that one of the distinguishing factors for the Shaykh was that he was a, a defender of the Ahlul Sunnah, mm -hmm. a defender of Aqeedah. Mm -hmm. So if you could mention some points regarding that, and also with any challenges that he faced defending the Aqaid of the Ahlul Sunnah mm -hmm. wal Jama'ah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, as I said before, if we look at the life of Sayyid Alawi, his father, um, Sayyid Alawi at his time, it wasn't that kind of strong. Still, the main teachers of the Haram, uh, the, there was a continuous tradition. The four madhahib were operating. Still. Yes, and uh, probably not in leading the Salawat, but what I mean is there are the muftis of the older madhahib. They are teaching in the Haram. They were teaching in the Haram. So the full Sunni curriculum, uh, was uh, operational at the time of Sayyid Alawi. So whenever there were conflicting uh, conflicts, then he was trying to deal with them really gently. The personality of Sayyid Muhammad is totally different. Mm -hmm. And as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared him for that. Because yeah, this uh, he's totally different. Uh, as I said, the Sayyid Alawi was so yani, kind. Sayyid Muhammad is a little bit confronting in a sense. So you have Jalali, Jamal and Jalal. Jalal, Jalal. <laughs> Sayyid Muhammad was Jalal. And by the way, you would see his Jalal at the beginning, when you get closer, SubhanAllah, you, you see Jamal in Jalal and Jalal in Jamal, SubhanAllah. when you get closer to him. And you feel that Hanan and, and compassion in his heart, SubhanAllah, the way, just when he embraces you, Rahimahullah, it's just a feeling as if you are not on this earth, not on this earth, with, with you feel that um, compassion and Hanan, is you know outpouring from his heart yes. when you when, when he used to embrace but his personality as i said i mean first instance when you see him it's very jalali moment and even sometimes when he's teaching they say <coughs> all the people in the dust will shake you know he's jalali very very kind of jalali rahimahullah so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wallahu ta'ala ala prepared him for that moment so he he felt that the tradition is Alhamdulillah, the tradition never dies, but it's kind of being underestimated and it's not as apparent as it used to be. And he felt that now this is part of the mission. And again, as a scholar of Hadith, uh, he can defend the manhaj of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah using definitely the Quran, all the Sunnah, and he knows the ins and outs of, of the Sunnah. So he felt that this is part of his mission, um, is to revive uh, the manhaj and to let people know that this is the tradition and this is the mainstream for centuries and not, no one should be uh, ashamed of saying I want to do a mawlid I do have a love for the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam, oh, and so on so he was gentle in a way he did not attack any any sects or any groups or any particular scholar and he was just trying to show that this is the truth this is the manhaj and even he tried it as, as probably we have seen many scholars who tried to defend Manhaj Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. I would say the main contribution of the Sayyid, other than again his depth uh, in discussion and connection to the Hadith, that he used Ibn Taymiyyah to prove many of the points. Mm -hmm. okay. Ibn Taymiyyah, who's the main authority for, for uh, our brothers uh, on the other side who had different or conflicting views with the mainstream of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. So he used Ibn Taymiyyah and he wanted to show them that probably you didn't understand well Ibn Taymiyyah. Probably you have more kind of stronger uh, opinions compared to, to uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, and he said, look, this is the main authority and he was quite open for uh, some of the things that you are so rigid about. So why not to go into that approach uh, if you don't want to follow the mainstream, at least your main authority that you claim you, you follow, uh, at least follow that kind of a little bit of uh, openness that they, they have. About the struggle, he went definitely, as I, as I said before, he went through life-threatening uh, things uh, that led him, by the way, to be out of Saudi for a few years. He had to leave the country. And uh, even the government advised advise him to do so because it wasn't safe for him. Um, and because of the intensity of the conflict that happened. Mm. Um, and he had a, like a private dialogue with the senior scholars. And there was no a good resolution for everyone. And then basically uh, the king 
um, you know, they, they have that kind of wisdom again to try to keep things in place, not to make it like a fitna. So he said uh, at that time, uh, ask both Sayyid Muhammad and the other group, don't try it about the topic. Khalas, everyone should kind of live his own life on his own way. And fortunately, they tried to um, kind of go around that and they uh, wrote some books uh, against the Sayyid Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi. And then the famous kind of uh, reply of the Sayyid Muhammad of Mafahim, Yajib and Tusahah, or notions need to be corrected. And then they again wrote against Sayyid Muhammad, but because he um, he wanted to abide to, to the king of the, uh, the the opinion of the king, he didn't write anything back. And we have seen the love of the Ummah for Sayyid Muhammad and for the Prophet before that. And many scholars from all over the world, they defended Sayyid Muhammad. Mm. So it got really intense. So he started to have da'wah outside. Uh, he came to the UK, by the way, in the late 70s. And Sheikh Babikir Hafidhullah Ra'a hosted him mm, in, in London. Um, uh, and uh, by the way, Sheikh Babikir has a thobe of the Sayyid <laughs> till now. <laughs> now. And um, he went after that to Indonesia. And he, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened for him the door in Indonesia. Um, what, after that, some of the diplomats in Saudi, they said, they called the Sayyid and say, we prefer that you don't now come back because of the, again, because of the intensity of uh, what's happening. And then he stayed in Indonesia for, for a while, for a few years, at which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened huge doors for him and he founded the... Uh, different institutions of learning and as I said some of them yani, some of them um, uh, the students they attend in one of them for example hundreds of thousand or linked to it so there are millions and millions of uh, followers subhanAllah either direct or indirect to uh, Sayyid Muhammad during that period he was offered different uh, kind of positions in different places so people want to get him mm -hmm. like in the UE and like in and uh, I think also um, at that time, then in Saudi, they realized that, again, this is uh, an important treasure for the country. And um, uh, subhanAllah, he came back again and uh, uh, he continued to just to teach mainly uh, privately. But during his years, while he was away or traveling extensively, uh, I think I have to mention the role also of his wife. Okay. The whole responsibility of the family was basically on Um, uh, um Ahmed Rahimahullah Ta'ala and uh, she was just uh, a greatest waliya in terms of her patience taking the responsibility of the family keeping you know Sayyid Muhammad mom was alive and she was old uh, mashallah the family of the Sayyid is a big family so she was uh, actually uh, having a, a huge um, responsibility Rahimahullah so it was a, a really tough time for the whole family, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. Mm -hmm. The absence of the father, and not a usual father, mm -hmm. like Sayyid Muhammad, and the absence of Sayyid Muhammad from the scholarly scene of the Hijaz was not an, an, easy, uh, an easy thing. Mm -hmm. um, and even, by the way, before that, and subhanAllah, the first time I met him privately, uh, I was just me and him, and I was really shaking. So he saw that I was very nervous. So he wanted to make things easy said oh, oh Sayyid Ma, let me tell you uh, about my story in the Haram I said Bismillah ya Sayyid, Sayyid he said you know when I was teaching at the Haram and uh, as you know there are Alhamdulillah many people used to attend at least 1000 and uh, when I used to walk home usually at least 500 would follow me <laughs> yeah and they would continue with him and, and then while I was going from Bab al -Salam, climbing the, the, the stairs and somebody came was hiding behind the pillar and he came out suddenly and hit he hit me in my face with the shoes and he was laughing Sayyid Muhammad oh, well, he was why he's telling this story he was laughing oh, oh, oh. and he hit me and he said it wasn't once it was twice it was twice and he was laughing but subhanallah was striking for me in this story in a way, it captured important part of his life, rahimahullah, which is the uh, the difficulties and the struggle he went through, but he had the joy in it. Mm. 
he had a spiritual reward to it, which is the connection with the with the Salihin or with the Prophet and Bisharat that he had. And though it was difficult, yes, for him, for the family, for but it was very rewarding. Very, very rewarding and for him. We just want to reiterate that point that what's this mission he's talking about is uh, twofold. One was uh, defending the aqidah of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, and secondly, was to reconnect the Ummah back to the Prophet. Yes. He felt that that connection had broken, and we're going to come on to that in a little while. Uh, and his <coughs> mission was to reconnect people and bring people's hearts back to the Prophet. <laughs> and just on this point, it's quite amazing because he, he mentioned this story and it leads on to my next question. Because just on this segment, there's a few questions we want to ask just to detail some points. Uh, you mentioned about him teaching in the Haram, there being a thousand people there. Uh, to teach in any mosque is, uh, is an honor because. Uh, the masajid are sha'airullah, uh, uh, the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, um, you know, to be able to teach inside the haram, you know, imagine the honor of that, being a teacher inside Masjid al Nabawi or being a teacher inside Masjid al Aqsa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve it. Uh, these are great honors. And his Sayyid Muhammad was a teacher in the haram and he would teach people. And there's actually a video online. Uh, I believe the video is, uh, it looks like it's Ramadan because he's talking about Badr. Badr and inshallah, Badr is coming up uh, on Tuesday. Uh, inshallah, it will be the 17th of Ramadan. And um, so uh, he's teaching inside the Haram. But we know that he left that post. Um, he The, the post, uh, he, he removed himself from that post. Uh, w- w- is there truth behind this that he did? T- yeah, actually, when again that kind of conflict happened, it was getting too um, intense and too tough. He felt it wasn't appropriate for for him to to continue to teach in the haram, mm-hmm. and also he felt probably that in all cases this that would be the the result of it. So he, um, um, yeah, he left teaching in the haram, and his uh, post also as a teacher in uh, Umm Al Qura too, and he just dedicated his life for his kind of private teaching and uh, and da'wah. Uh, as I said, because he felt it was too too intense and it wasn't right to uh, probably to continue, especially after those kind of incidents. Just I need to, to continue. Yeah. People did not leave him. The, the person who had said Muhammad, yeah. yani he was, <laughs> he has yani beaten harshly. The, the person who, who abused Sayyid Muhammad, mm-hmm. um, he was, yani, you know, 500 students are out there. So. Oh. They didn't leave. <laughs> Just so but it was sad to, to happen in Haram, but yeah, you can't. And definitely he was trying, Sayyid Muhammad, to, to hold the students mm-hmm. because there is, a, again, uh, yani holiness for the place and for the spiritual uh, place uh, there in the Haram. But sometimes you can't control when you see your teacher, uh, somebody is trying to emulate the scholar of Mecca in such a way it's very difficult to not to react to that it's so so insulting not only for Sayyid Muhammad it was insulting for the old scholars uh, of Mecca and for the tradition and for and probably it was an insult for the Haram that somebody like Sayyid Muhammad is being insulted after physically back from the Haram and teaching yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah it's a, yeah he was in his halqa and then he was going out of so um yes i think people shouldn't uh, reacted like that, but also you can't blame them. In a sense, they can't control their own emotion when they have seen the teacher um, being. Sorry, a uh, lot yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, so just um, so that's <coughs> the first segment done on that. The second one was uh, like I mentioned his his life's purpose. You know, if you were to round up, it was a two. It was twofold. So the first one was defending the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah, and secondly, in that. Uh, would be to reconnect people and uh, to the Prophet ﷺ. And, um, <coughs> you know, what's amazing is that uh, in that period that Sheikh Muhammad bin Alawi is in, and especially Sheikh Alawi, his father as well, you find that this tradition of reconnecting people's hearts to the Prophet ﷺ because the ulama, uh, Rabbaniyin, they felt and they saw that their connections being lost with the Prophet ﷺ because of certain aqaid, certain beliefs, certain ideas, um, certain understandings are leading people to move away from that living connection with the Prophet ﷺ. And you find scholars all around the world uh, who are in this period, in the last 20th century, uh, trying to reconnect people back to the Prophet ﷺ. Like for example, one of the great scholars that you can obviously, I think everybody here will know, is the great uh, 
later Lebanese scholar, but originally Palestinian, uh, Sheikh uh, Yusuf bin Ismail al Nabhani, Rahimullah Ta'ala. All his books have this flavor, which is to reconnect the Prophet to people to the Prophet. If you go to the, sh the lands of Sham, particularly Damascus and these areas, you have the great Muhaddis of Sham. Uh, Badruddin al Hassani, Rahimullah Ta'ala. This is his mission, his idea as well of what he's trying to achieve with the people. Uh, if you come into uh, the, the, the into Makkatul Mukarrama, uh, aside from this particular family who we're talking about, Sayyid Alawi and Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi, and this great uh, Idrisi family, you have the likes of Babu Sayyid and Zaini al Dahlan, these, uh, and Sheikh uh, uh, Saleh Kamal, and these scholars. They they really stand out, especially uh, with Zaini Dahlan. With Zaini Dahlan, if you read his books, you, he is he is really trying to bring people back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same thing in the subcontinent. In our subcontinent, South Asian tradition, we have great scholars and ulama uh, in the last century uh, who were bringing people back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, Iqbal. He was one of those people, uh, but Iqbal says something very profound, <coughs> and uh, it really sums up. What, uh, how he's describing that period of time in which he lived, the 1850s to the 1950s, this 100-year period. What he's saying in that, uh, what he's essentially saying is, uh, and he writes, he says, Wo faka kash ke mot se darta nahi zara. This is the words. Wo faka kash ke mot se darta nahi zara. So he's saying, you know, the colonial period, when these colonizers are coming into Muslim lands, they're pillaging Muslim lands, um, uh, Yusuf Nabahani is in, in, in Lebanon and it's being co it's, uh, we, ha we have uh, a sense of colonization taking place there. Invaders are coming in, in that, in, into that part of the world. We have North Africa, we have the Katani family, we have the French trying to take over there. If you go to the subcontinent, you have infiltration uh, of uh, the British Raj there and in the Hijaz as well. Uh, we have this happening everywhere. So what Iqbal is saying is he's explaining that scene. He's saying, When all these colonizers turned up, when all these infiltrations turned up from within and without, they're looking at the Muslim people. They're like, these are really poverty-stricken people. But they're not scared of death. They're not scared of dying. So when we come with all our gunpowder and all our guns and all our ideas and all of these things, uh, we're just trying to scare them so that they become obedient. But they're not even scared of dying anyway. But they've got nothing... To the, they've got nothing of the world of the world with them, and then they say, "How do we devise? How do we how do we enslave them? Um, you know, mentally, physically. How do we do it?" He says, "Wo faka kash ke mod se darta nahi zara, ruhe Muhammad uske badan se nikal do. Take the soul of the Prophet out of their heart, <laughs> and then after that, we've 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 got them where we want them. And that's that period is happening. So in the subcontinent, we have the likes of Fadl Haq al Khairabadi, rahimahullah taala. He plays a huge role." in defending Sunnah, in reconnecting people back to the Prophet We have the likes of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. You know, his whole life's mission is to defend the Prophet He used to actually say, the Imam used to say that, um, I'm happy when people uh, call me and insult me, because at least during that time, they're not saying anything about the Prophet That's his whole life mission. So it's incredible that we have all of this happening. The political situation there, we have uh, the... Uh, you know, um, the Akida issues, the, the disconnection that's happening there. Sayyid Muhammad is in that picture as well. He's somebody who's got that mission as well. And you see that stand out in him. And another point on this is that, you know, uh, it was, it, it's, it's a, an obligation of the ulama to do this. The challenges of their time, they have to deal with it. So it's not like we're praising Sayyid Muhammad for doing his job, but we're praising him because how beautifully he did his job. So this leads on to the question, and the question is that, uh, what works did he write? I mean, all uh, all his works have this flavor in it. Yeah. But what particular works did he write on this uh, on this angle of um, number one, aqida based, defending Ahl Sunnah aqida, and then second fold, which was reconnecting the Prophet uh, the Ummah to the Prophet Ali What what kind of major books are there in this regard? I think the major two books, um, if we want to start with those, are definitely Notions Need to be Corrected or Mafahim, and then Manhaj al Salaf Fi Fahm al Nusus, or The Way of Salaf in Understanding the, 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 the Scriptures, uh, basically Sunnah and Quran. These are the main uh, books and main projects at which he looked at what is the issue that we have in terms of why we have those extreme views. And he noticed immediately 
the issue is we don't have the, the right methodology of understanding the muscles. So he started from there to re-establish, to revive, or to let people know what is the real methodology of uh, understanding these scriptural, scriptural texts, like especially Quran and Sunnah. So Mafahim and um, also Manhaj um, al-Salafi, uh, Fahm al-Nusus. And these two books, as you're probably going to see, it's divided into things which are related to fiqh and aqidah. And definitely the Mex people have, some of the people again, who think that um, they have a phobia from like shirk and these things between the maqam of lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the maqam of nubuwa. Mm -hmm. So he just to to make it very clear, there are two different realms and there's no, exactly. there's no connection, no, physical, or there's astaghfirullah, nothing beyond that, or ta'deem, but exactly, it's, it's something different. So these are the main which related to the methodology and also it's flavored definitely with, with love. But then I think one of the important books related directly to the Prophet alayhi salatu is um, Muhammad al-Insan al-Kamil, Muhammad the perfect man, and it's tra translated into English, alhamdulillah, and al dakhair al muhammadiyah And al dakhair al muhammadiyah I think it's kind of the, the that sparked the whole, the whole uh, challenge that uh, uh, happened or the conflict uh, that happened. And that love of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam led Sayyid Muhammad uh, rahimahullah, as I said before, to have even opinions to to show glorification to the Prophet والسلام, in a way no no one before him said that. No. So, for example, one of the interesting points he mentioned about the hadith, the famous hadith, that the angels took the Prophet والسلام, opened the chest and they removed like a, a black cattle or something from his heart. And they say, وَذَلِكَ حَظُّ الشَّيْطَانِ مِنْكَ Hmm? This is the portion of shaitan from you. Mm. So, and he mentioned all the muhaddithin, how they explained the hadith and different opinions. And then he mentioned his own. He said, well, what I, he said like this, what I understand from that, that portion of the shaitan from the mercy, because he was sent as a merciful, the whole universe, including the shaitan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took that portion, so he doesn't have mercy toward the shaitan. It doesn't mean portion of shaitan means that shaitan can whisper to him, he's beyond that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So from rahmah, and he supported his, again, view with some evidence that the shaitan, in the hereafter, when he sees the intercessions of the Prophet ﷺ, he would try to raise his head so the Prophet see him and he might be merciful toward him. So he said, this is a dalil that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what took is actually the, the portion of rahmah, of mercy toward the shaitan. Another thing, uh, interesting point, also he mentioned, لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد. Uh, as you uh, probably know, many of the Mufassirin say this is an actual qasam. So Allah m is making an oath. Makkah because of the Prophet is there. Sayyid Muhammad said, no, it's actually la is la, nafiyah. So he's saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, how come I make qasam by Makkah and you are in Makkah and you are more beloved to me than Makkah? Oh. And how come, how come I do qasam by Makkah and you are the beloved and you are in Makkah? So I should do the qasam by you, not by Makkah. Oh this is what, what does it mean? And so on. So you see interesting point. I don't think so. Anyone can think of such points unless first he read the whole tradition and he's filled with love. That the love is, as I said, is just coming out of of him for the Prophet Sallallahu Openings, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. No doubt. MashaAllah. Um, you've actually answered some of the questions that we had ah, regarding sorry. the books and al-mafahim <coughs> and the contents of these books. And uh, the Khair, I read something interesting in the introduction. Uh, the Sayyid Muhammad Rahimahullah in the introduction of the Khair mentions that one of the reasons why he wrote the book was that somebody asked him, who was such a man that he could not reject the reject request. The so a man came to him and said to him, You mm -hmm. need to write this book. Mm -hmm. But that person was such a man that he held in such high esteem that he could have rejected his request. Now, a friend of mine was with uh, Sayyid Abbas rahimahullah ta'ala and Sayyid Abbas is the brother of Sayyid, Sayyid Muhammad. Muhammad. So Sayyid Abbas says, I was there when that happened. Allahu Akbar. says, I was there when um, the Shaykh came to meet our father, Sayyid Alawi, 
and he's he's mentioning these issues. So as you mentioned, in the time of Sayyid Alawi, uh, it was different. But as the time of Sheikh Muhammad came, th- there was a huge change. So the Sheikh came and he's complaining to Sheikh Alawi about how th- everything is changing. So then he said to Sheikh Alawi, where's Muhammad? Call him forward. And then he s- gave him order that you need to write Allah this Allah book. Allah you need to write a book defending the Ahlul Sunnah, mm-hmm. defending the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, reconnecting the people back to the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Sayyid Abbas says that this man was a Shaykh Ahmed Diyauddin al-Madani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Now, uh, he's known in South Asia as Qutb al-Madina, the Qutb of Madina, Ziauddin Ahmed Madani, the Khalifa of Imam Ahmed Rida Khan, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So, that's, you know, the, the start of the journey. And um, also, as you mentioned, the start of the difficulty as well. But he persevered through that difficulty. And because of that, like you said, we are sitting here today remembering Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Um, the number of questions, um, you've answered a lot of them, so just looking through which ones you have, you've not answered. Um, inshallah, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Imam Sir. There's one question that you, you did answer. Um, <coughs> um, while you're answering this one, uh, I'll ask this question first, and then we can obviously, we've got Mufahim here, uh, the translations in English, uh, the book that the, uh, the Sayyid was uh, talking about. Um, <coughs> it has been translated into the English language. Um, and uh, Mullah Nisa will show it now. Show it up. Uh, this is uh, the book that was being talked about. So the notions that must be corrected by Sayyid Muhammad, in which he defends the creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Um, so uh, this is uh, the Mafahim. Um, we also talked about his public dialogues uh, or discussions on this topic with, you know, uh, the others. Um, did any public discussions take place uh, on this topic, or were there any public dialogues that happened? You didn't <coughs> mention there was private dialogues. Yeah. Uh, is there any details of those uh, if there was no public ones and uh, generally uh, with regards to this? Um, no public ones um, except probably the writings that you have uh, seen but actual dialogue um, there was no public ones except the private ones and also the private ones yani, they were not um, reported as a request from the king um, as I said he was trying just to keep not to, to cause um, like um, a big fitna out of what's happening so even Sayyid Muhammad did not speak uh, probably he spoke to few people but I'm not aware to whom to be honest about what actually happened in those dialogue so um, we don't know the details of, of those dialogue and in public because he uh, requested probably you would know for a public munadara public debate at which the um, um, scholars and muftis of the senior scholars from at least one delegate or more from all the major Muslim countries they would be present and they will kind of uh, make judgment about the debate they control it and they make but um, yeah, any the other people they they didn't accept that um, uh, view from or request from Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi Malik so nothing happened in public and as I said he was uh, Sayyid Muhammad tried to respect whatever um, was um, yani the opinion of the government about controlling things mm. and he used just to to be uh, either to do things inside his house as you know he didn't have any public things or traveling around and doing da'wah um, outside but there is no public things happen MashaAllah so with um, uh, you mentioned uh, twice now regarding how the Sheikh would stand and defend but at the same time <coughs> his his uh, character was such that he wouldn't get into argumentation or insult yeah I read regarding um, the books were written against the Shaykh, uh, but he wouldn't get into argumentation. He was insulted. Other ulama around the world, like Shaykh Yusuf Rifa'i and others, would write to yeah. defend yeah. the Shaykh, but him in and of himself wouldn't get involved in this. And even in uh, Mafahim, in Notions, and in other books where he's defending the beliefs, he's not using a, uh, a, 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 a offensive mode. You know, yeah, and he uh, didn't name any any name uh, mm-hmm. from the opposing. Uh, though I have to mention one of the scholars uh, who wrote against the Sayyid, and unfortunately that was book was dis- being distributed into schools okay. against the Sayyid. Huh? Uh, I remember I got a copy. Uh, it's in Saudi. I mean, if you look at the insults against him, it's unimaginable. Absolutely. In the introduction, now, in the introduction. 
he says that you know um, this is a refutation of that called so and so and against what his poisoned arm point wrote and things like that and in one subhanallah I read part of the books and then I reached to a phrase I couldn't believe it he was again speaking about the Sayyid and he said وَأَتَى بِجَهَلَاتِ وَضَلَالَاتِ لَمْ يَأْتِي بِهَا أَبُو جَهَلْ وَلَا أُبَيُّ بْنُ خَلَفْ مِنْ أَقْطَ وَلَا أَبُو لَهَبْ مِنْ أَقْطَى بِالْكُفْرِ وَالشِّرْ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ يعني so they insulted him in a very أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ أَنْسَكَالَ لِمَاتَ and then this is how this is the prophetic way again just addressing يعني he took back the discussion into a scholarly purely scholarly discussion and tried to take the points he was kind of that scholar was trying to make he طبعاً, remove all the insults mm-hmm. and then just he was addressing the uh, the points and this is the akhlaq and the way of uh, I just want to get through these questions inshallah uh, one question was uh, one uh, that the, we know that Sayyid Muhammad was an international scholar and we've now seen uh, at what point he did go international it was after he l- left Makkah Sharif and uh, you know he was uh, w- one thing we see with Sayyid Muhammad is that he was trying to like mobilize the Muslim world, trying to get them towards education, towards uh, reconnecting to the Prophet ﷺ. He was doing a lot of, he was very mutaharrik, he was, he was a, a mover and a shaker. And especially in the Arab world, you could see that he was, you know, he, he definitely has a, a maqam and a, and a place and people know what he was about, what he was trying to propagate. Um, so, uh, w- um, what did he do? Um, what kind of, uh, you know, projects uh, do we have from the Sheikh? One of them, we obviously know that he opened schools um, what else did he do in order to mobilize Muslims to get them together to, you know, um, to to um, get them together in the sense of, uh, rather I should say that, uh, what did he do for for them to become reconnected to the Prophet ﷺ? With the question I'm actually asking, mm. I think he has done many things. Um, some of them I think we already mentioned. Stab- founding actually schools, and not only this, also he was supporting the people of. Who has uh, who had projects to establish such, for example, madaris and, and and schools, and they used to travel to attend the opening, for example, session for that to basically um, to to give his support for for them and and the other way of um, um, spreading the knowledge definitely is distributing his books uh, that he authored um, to different places and the third I would say uh, also. Um, doing like uh, visits of da'wah at which he went you know he used to travel extensively to meet scholars in different places to do majalis especially praising the prophet mawalid other than the isnadi kind of part of it which is to take ijazat and to give also to do like uh, mawalid and whatever he goes say it whatever he goes he he must do like mawlids read the uh, Read uh, Burda, read uh, so to praise the Prophet ﷺ. Also to support and to um, um, his peer scholars when they do like conferences and uh, in different places. So he used to attend. And by the way, Subhanallah, he used among the very committed people. So uh, I remember once he attended the conference in the uh, in the UAE. He was the first person to be in in the first row, waiting for the things to start. And then he saw some of the students of knowledge and scholars, they skipped part of the sessions and they went for shopping. And he was so harsh on them. He said, this is even a haram. You were paid the ticket and the hotel not to go and shop, is to attend the session. So probably this is haram, that you are spending the time in something that you were not paid for. I mean, they paid for you. Um, hot and hot. So he was very kind of committed to support the scholars, even if they were young scholars. He used to attend and support them, and uh, you know, uh, give them his support, without telling. Also, for um, kind of young uh, scholars and uh, um, projects at early stages, he he used to financially support them too, without announcing that and without um, uh, telling though. And the connection with his students and their support continued for quite a long time. Throughout his his journey. <coughs> um, before we uh, come to uh, the concluding uh, one or two questions, um, there was a question that we were asking each other about, and I think when um, Sheikh Mubashir contacted you, 
and you, I think you were surprised that there's such a presence of Sheikh Muhammad within our community. Yeah. So we were discussing this and we came to, we, re, we thought about this and we came to a conclusion as well, an answer as to why Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi rahimahullah ta'ala resonates so much with the South Asian community. So you come into the circles of you know, the South A Asian community, Sayyid Muhammad rahimahullah ta'ala resonates. It's a name that's mentioned quite often. And one of the uh, reasons is that there's that connection between the traditions. So if you go into the mid-1900s, um, you know, whilst Sheikh Muhammad uh, rahimahullah ta'ala was a young man, the elder ulama of South Asia, many of them had a connection with Sheikh Muhammad. Uh, he mentioned his, in his book the likes of um, Abdul Alim al-Siddiqi, Diyaudin uh, Ahmad al-Madani, uh, Sheikh Mustafa Rida Khan, rahimahullah ta'ala. <laughs> but then when you go later on to the next generation, who are contemporaries of Sheikh Muhammad bin Alawi, they had good connections as well. They took ijazat from the Sheikh. And in fact, as we were doing the research for this, we met some ulama who mentioned that Sayyid Muhammad was a sanad for the ulama of Pakistan. They would use him as a sanad, as a reference point. So they would write books, for example, on the permissibility of Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But then it wouldn't be received that well. So they would just simply take the works of Sayyid Muhammad, translate into Urdu and just sell everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. We have Zia al Quran publications uh, who translated. Uh, there's an old publication called um, uh, Alim Dawt Islamia. Alim Dawt Islamia. So you have a Zakhair al Muhammadiyah. No, this was translated because the same issues and the false uh, beliefs that were spreading in the Haram at that time were also spreading in India and Pakistan. So the likes of Alam Abdul Hakim Sharaf al Qadri, who's contemporary of Sayyid Muhammad. Um, Mufti Khan Muhammad Qadri, who passed away just two, three years ago, Rahimahullah mm -hmm. Ta'ala, he translated the Khair al Muhammadiyah, he translated a few books of the Shaykh, and they would say, Okay, you're not listening to us, listen to Muhaddithul Haramain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And then the third generation of ulama, who are the late, late 1900s, early 2000s, mm. who are our teachers, they were students of Sayyid Muhammad. So they, uh, you know, uh, they translated the books. So Masha notions Allah. that must be corrected, translated into English. Masha you have uh, the, the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, written by uh, Sayyid Muhammad, mm -hmm. translated by our local Sheikh Ahm, uh, Amjad Mahmood. This is the first edition. Then recently is printed the second edition. Masha and then you have uh, the books on Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj being translated. So all three generations the generation of Sayyid Alawi, generation of Sayyid Muhammad, Masha and the generation after Masha were all connected to the Shaykh. So for that reason, there was a huge uh, connection between Sayyid Muhammad and our circles. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And one other point is that in South Asia, for us, an alim, a scholar of the deen, and a man of tasawwuf, nafsu shaykh, it's the same thing. Naam. You Naam. have kullu alimin sufi, Naam. wa kullu sufi wa alim. Naam. Naam. And that's what we see in our tradition. If you have a man of deen, he's a man of tasawwuf. You have a man of tasawwuf, he's a man of man deen. Of deen. <laughs> but that's not, you don't always find that in the Arab world. Sahih. Th there's a, a distinction that has been created between this is an alim and that is a Sufi. Yeah, it's a later uh, kind of later. Uh, um, uh, phenomena. Yeah, yeah, it's a later phenomena. And subhanAllah, even Sayyid Muhammad, his way of doing that, you know, many people would approach him to, uh, for example, to ask for bay'ah or he used to say, Tariquna matwiyun fil ilm. Our way is embedded in knowledge, which means if you attend the Duru's, you will take the tariq. You will read. Exactly. And he, he used to say that uh, our tariqa is tariqa to ulama Makkah. So he, he gave it that name rather than a specific tariqa. Um, because this is the nature, subhanAllah, of Hijaz, which is a mix of different traditions and. Uh, so he used to be, and subhanAllah, I found that phenomena even in the period um, I was studying uh, in my PhD. Scholars didn't have a specific tariqa. So they used to have an asanid of different turuq, and then they used to mix it without having a specific name for there. If you look at the books of tabaqat of scholars of Hijaz, and ma many of them, even the Sufi ones, <laughs> rarely you will find uh, Naqshabandi or uh, Shattari or, Ch no. It's just uh, a Sufi Sheikh and that's it because that was the nature as if they were embracing the whole traditions and the whole world without being 
um, subhanallah, connected to a specific kind of uh, tariq. And Sayyid Muhammad uh, continued that tradition in a way. So, <coughs> inshallah, we'd, we'd, we've got probably probably two more questions left. Inshallah, and we're gonna and we're gonna break up. And uh, this is the um, the uh, very spiritual part of the segment uh, segment of our discussion. Mm-hmm. Inshallah, um, can you tell us about uh, Sayyid Muhammad's uh, connection and relationship <coughs> to his great great grandmother, uh, Sayyida Khatija Tul Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha? Mm, uh, there's something really special there, and I want you to explain that. Give us something on that, inshallah. I think um, Sayyidatna Khadija has a special place for all the people of Hijaz, mm-hmm. uh, especially people of Mecca. And uh, one of the titles usually people give to Sayyidatna Khadija is Ummu Makkah, the mother of Mecca, mm-hmm. because she is the mother of Mecca, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And uh, Sayyid Muhammad, rahmatullahi ta'ala, had a very, very special connection with Sayyidatna Khadija. He used to visit quite often, especially when there is something. He used to visit always, but when there is especially something, he used to visit Sayyidatna Khadija and he would send salam and uh, uh, make dua there. Um, and uh, when leaving Mecca, when coming back to Mecca, he um, used to visit Sayyidatna Khadija. And especially toward the end of his life, probably the last five or six months of his life, he used to visit every single night at the time of Sahar, just before Fajr. Rahimahullah. And um, one day, uh, Sayyid Ahmad would drive him there. One day, Sayyid Abdullah, another son. So after a while, because Sayyid Ahmad and Sayyid Abdullah, they used to study and they used to work. So they found it difficult every single day on the time of Sahar to visit Sayyidatna Khadija. So Sayyid Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Ali, once, uh, just probably in the last two months or so of his life, he looked at Sayyid Ahmad and he said, Oh, my son Ahmad, probably... I know it's difficult for you to take me every single night and probably you are wondering why I do so. He said, whenever I send salam to her, I do hear the reply in my ears. And Alhamdulillah, the, the beautiful thing is is that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala united Sayyid Muhammad uh, with his m- grandmother, Sayyida Khatija radiallahu anha, in that he is buried very close, I believe. Right in front, right in front of Sayyida Khatija, he's buried there. So despite, you know, centuries of, 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 of you know, th- over a thousand plus years gap between that father, uh, that mother and that son, uh, we find that Sayyid Muhammad reached... Uh, uh, by Sayyidah Khatija radiallahu anha in that he's actually buried right beside and there's actually we were, we were actually um, I just asked uh, Sayyid Ma'an earlier that um, you know <coughs> does, uh, d- do you have a brother-in-law called Muyassar uh, and he told me that yes we do have one of the uh, one of the daughters of Sayyid Muhammad is buried to someone called Muyassar and uh, he actually uh, we were reading that uh, Sayyidah Khatija actually came to the dream of Sayyid Muhammad and told Sayyid Muhammad that Marry this daughter to Muyassar. <laughs> so, this is these are the children of Sayyidah Khatija, and uh, that's that's his ch- that's that's her children. Um, so, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa taala be pleased with her, and may Allah Amen. subhanahu wa taala be pleased with him, and may He unite her uh, with uh, Sayyidina uh, Muhammad uh, or Sayyidina Muhammad uh, bin Alabi. May Allah unite him with her in Jannatul Fardos, inshallah. I just want to go, inshallah, onto. The last uh, point, inshallah, which is just uh, essentially then the Sheikh, uh, he passed away, uh, which was on the, the Friday, was the 15th of Ramadan, I believe. Uh, he passed on the 15th of Ramadan and uh, it was a Friday and uh, the year was 1425, which is equivalent to 2004. Uh, so the Sheikh was uh, 60 years uh, of age at that point and uh, he, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, 
Yeah, he, he rahimahullah ta'ala passed away at that age, uh, so he was 60 uh, years of age, the year was 2004, um, <coughs> and uh, he passed away in Makkah al-Mukarramah, and obviously he is buried in Jantul Mu'alla. Um, we, the, the Shaykh, uh, he passed on, was there any particular, was there any, what was the cause for his passing? I mean, he was 60, which was not very old, right? I mean, Yeah, uh, 60 Hijri and probably 58 uh, um, if we use the Georgian calendar, yeah. Um, Subhanallah, he had, um, yeah, he, he had uh, diabetes, and um, I think it was due due to this is the the apparent kind of cause that he had a high level of um, um, sugar, and that led to um, to to his death, rahimahullah taala. But Subhanallah, we were I was telling the brothers. Um, I think he was quite clear about giving indications about his passing, but the people around him, you know, you wouldn't think, you don't want to believe, don't want to believe it. Mm. Yani, just to mention a few things. Mm. One of them is, I got married four months before he passed away, rahimahullah. And uh, probably the engagement happened like one and a half years before that, or yeah, one and a half years. So, especially the last few months, um, he used almost every single day, um, used to speak to uh, his wife, uh, Umm Ahmad, and then he told, please speak to Ma'an's mother and ask her to, even if they just get married in one room, mm -hmm. let them quickly get married. Let them quickly get married. I said, why are you saying that? Let them quickly get married. So, subhanAllah. The other sign, the... Uh, you know, each Sha'ban, Laylat al Nasm Sha'ban, the tradition in Hijaz, and I think in many places in the world, they read Yasin three times, mm -hmm. one of them with an intention to have a long life. Usually the Sayyids say the intention, and then people would read Yasin, and he would read too. Except in that year. That specific Yasin, he asked a Sheikh beside him, he said, Give the people the intention of long life. And I think the clearest sign probably is uh, he was asked at that time to uh, have a TV show about Mafahim, mm -hmm. the famous one. And uh, the presenter and the, uh, the channel Iqra, they were trying to have 30 episodes. And Sayyid Muhammad said, no, it's only 15. Yeah, Sayyid, uh, let's have it 30. There are many topics and it's an important thing. Let people hear your point of view. He said, 15. Yeah, Sayyid Muhammad Tayyib, let's do it um, 20. So, Ashar al Awakhir, we don't have episode, but at least let's have to. He said, it's 15, and this is the last time I will appear in TV, on TV. And the 15th was, on, was actually aired on the day he passed away. Allah. Rahimahullah. As if he was saying, these are the notions I lived for and I died for. SubhanAllah, this is my message. So he ended his life. SubhanAllah, every single day in Ramadan, the presenter used to call his Sayyid Rahmatullah Ali and ask him, Hi, Ya Sidi, uh, is there any comments, anything, anything? And SubhanAllah, they couldn't have the last call because it was just at the day that he, he passed away, which was kind of a, a clear uh, indication. So mainly it was, uh, SubhanAllah, um, yeah, related to diabetes. And just before passing away, he was at the hospital, by the way, and almost while they were taking him out, when he had that kind of, do you call it attack or what do you call it? Uh, Something related to, sorry? Uh, yeah, anyway, so he was actually, people who saw him, they thought he, he, he passed away. He went to the hospital, mm -hmm. and subhanAllah, he, then he got um, his conscious back, and he walked without a stick to the car and then to his home. Because he usually used to, subhanAllah, make dua that, Oh Allah, take my, my soul while um, with in between my books and my students. Mm. That he was, he was dua. And uh, people came to see him, so Sahur, just before Ramadan. And he, did, uh, he, took, he ate a little bit and he made the intention. And he asked Sayyid Abbas, he said, Sayyid Abbas, the famous Sayyid, uh, Hussein Hashim, he was a munshid of Medina, famous munshid. He used, he disliked the mention of uh, death. 
But just before dying, he did in shad of a qasida which says, بجانب الحبيب إن مت فاحفروا لي قبرة بجانب الحبيب ولو كان شبرة. If I, if I pass away, then bury me in a grave beside the beloved, even if it was just so small. So he asked Sayyidina, Sayyid Abbas, Sayyid Abbas, uh, do in shad of this qasida. Sayyid Abbas said, Ya Sayyid, why you want to a mention of death? And no, no, please do in shad of it. Ya Sayyid, he asked him again, do in shad of it. And subhanAllah, this is another sign because that was uh, the last thing Sayyid Hussein Hashim made in shad of, and after that he passed away as if he's stilling. This is the last in shad we will hear, and then. And he went into his room. Um, usually he used to uh, to sleep at least part of the day. Probably then we need to mention his schedule for just mm -hmm. people to understand. He went into his uh, bed with his students and he asked his students to uh, cover him well. And by the way, Sayyid Rahmatullahi Ta'ala used to, uh, to sleep while he was dressing thilb as if he's meeting people when he used to sleep. And subhanAllah, just he asked him to cover him well to make sure that he's sleeping and just he, he made the intention of Siyam and just before Fajr he, he passed away Rahmatullahi Ta'ala between his books and between his students between his students SubhanAllah <coughs> May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala raise Sayyidina Shaykh Muhammad uh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala his darajat um, it's mentioned that after the Shaykh was buried um, some time later the grave was dug up because the practice of Maqbaratul Mu'alla that they dig up the graves so could you mention about that and you also mentioned prior regarding Sheikh Alawi as well yeah Sayyid Alawi yeah, this is uh, because usually what they do is they open after 9 or 10 years because many people want to be worried in Mecca and Medina and Sayyid Alawi's grave was opened if I'm not mistaken three times and his body was as is so uh, when that happened, usually they close it and they put a sign so they don't open it again. Mm -hmm. So um, I have heard and probably th there are uh, sources that the first time they did with Sayyid Muhammad, because now less than 20 years, so they, that happened once. Still, subhanAllah, his body uh, as is, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. And this is, by the way, quite common. In, in, yani, we know many people uh, around in the family and among the scholars of Medina. And among them, the famous Al Imam Al Bayanuni, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, the one who said, um, Jasadun Tamakana Hubbu Ahmad Afihi Tallahi in Al Arda La Tublihi. So he said that, and actually he, he showed us that. <laughs> Rahimahullah. Uh, in Medina. He was buried in Medina. And, and many scholars, subhanAllah, so there are a certain signs. Uh, they put it when they open the grave and feel on it like this. Rahimahumullah ta'ala. Apologies, Shaykh, we missed one question regarding the schedule of yeah. Sayyid Muhammad. I think this is important because yes. it shows people how um, a practical aspect of their life. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. So Sayyid Rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, he used to, as all the salihin and ulama, to wake up between one hour up to two hours before Fajr depending on different situations and at the is uh, at uh, when he was uh, quite at his youth and he was uh, um, residing very close to haram he used to spend that time in the haram in tawaf especially he used to do tawaf and adhkar and while doing tawaf all the night uh, and then come back and start uh, praying with the students and then al-awrad and teaching and so on but when uh, he um, moved to a place which is a little bit away from Haram, then he used to do Qiyam al layl with the students. So he would sleep at home and then um, come to the madrasa, like one and a half hour before Fajr or so, wake up the students and they start reading Adhkar and Qiyam al layl And then after that, they pray Fajr. After Fajr, they continue. Adhkar and Awrad, uh, up to just before Ishraq. And then when they finish, he would ask, Ha, is it Ishraq time or not? They say, still Ya Sidi. Mm -hmm. He will bring his own um, notebook and he will start authoring at that time too. This is one of the times that he used to author books. When the Ishraq comes, he would pray Ishraq and they will have a, a quick rest. Uh, and then after that, he would start um, sharp at around between 9 and 10. The uh, subhanAllah, I need to double check. Um, and then he will have like three or four durus, 
teaching sessions up to Salat al-Dhuhr. And he will give special durus and teaching sessions for the people of service at that time. So the people who are serving the other students in the madrasa or serving the house or whatever, he dedicates some time for them. So they have a special dars with him. And after that, just before Dhuhr, other people come and they study with him. Pray Dhuhr. After Dhuhr, he would have a, a light um, lunch and then also have a little bit of uh, a rest and then uh, uh, pray Asr after Asr Awrad and he start teaching again a few durus, especially for people who are not resident students, people of Mecca. And then he will teach them and also author at that time and prepare for the main lesson, which is after Maghrib. I remember once I was telling the brothers uh, at that time of Asr, three people were with the, with the Sayyid. One is consulting him with something, so he's speaking in his ears. Another person is reading and he's commenting on the text. The third was writing while he was dictating a book. Three people at the same time. No, nobody told me about it. I've seen it myself. Radiyallahu anh. So because of uh, how they utilize their time, subhanAllah. And then Salat al-Maghrib, after Salat al-Maghrib, again, this is the main teaching session, which is open for everyone, resident students and people from outside. Um, this is the session which I mention usually 300 to 500 people attend on daily basis. And then also they read uh, a bit of awrad, uh, the teaching session, then Salat al-Isha, some of Inshad, and in many cases Mawlid, <laughs> after the death, or at least the Qiyam part of the Mawlid sometimes. Uh, and then uh, people would, uh, if somebody wants to meet the Sayyid, uh, they would would meet him uh, at that time. Um, after that, he would go home. This is the time of the family from almost 9 p.m. up to 12. This is the family time, around three hours, and good three hours. And as I said before, he engaged his family in the process of writing and authoring. Also, he would ask their, uh, their daughters and to bring books. And, and he would stay with them up to 12. And then he will have a rest from 12 to 3 uh, a.m. And this is kind of the normal schedule of the Sayyid. Always he would move with a small uh, handbag at which, uh, again, a notebook and a pen. Whenever he finds uh, yani a time or the right time, he would start writing. Even uh, in the car while driving, somebody would drive him and he would be writing in the, in the car. On. So all his life, uh, like teaching. And then he would wake up again at 3 a.m. and this is kind of going back to his uh, schedule. Why is this important? I think, again, to see how those people um, used to live and how they spend their time and they were very, for them, time was like one of the most precious mm -hmm. things that they have. This is, I think, one important lesson. The other important lesson is that, as you probably noticed, the only time he spent with the family from 9 to 3 and half of it sleeping. Though he spent three hours with the family, but as I said, very quality, he, he gave them very quality time. But as you can imagine, the other um, like 16, 18 hours of the time with the students, with the students, even when they, the students see him eating, drinking, they learn from him, even sleeping, they learn from him. The etiquette and the adab of the Prophet والسلام, and, you know, the adhkar and the awrad and, and being in the suhbah of the Sayyid, through that, um, it, as I said, he transmit like the, the tariqah uh, or the tarbi happens, you know, around the durus, as you can see, probably he does teaches, he used to teach um, like seven or eight sessions per day and around them, before them, after them, awrad. So the people get fulfilled intellectually and spiritually, al awrad and al dars and and again, when he see when they see him, how he deals with with the people around them, also they learn in that sense. So, Subhanallah, it's a it's an amazing uh, schedule. If you allow me, just to end with few verses, uh, he he wrote uh, just few poems, and this is one of the poems that he wrote, um, as mentioned by uh, Sayyid Ahmed told me that. It looks, Wallahu A'lam, after reaching yani, like a Qutbiyah or something like that, he wrote this poem about his experience. Where he starts by saying, Bashir fu'adaka falwisalu qaribu wa mu'ammilu al-ihsan laysa yakhibu. Give God tidings to your heart, 
for union is near and the one who hopes for grace is never disappointed. ظهرت علامات القبول فطالعت قلبي بسعد بات فيه يطيب The signs of acceptance shone upon my heart with the joy in which my heart indulges. في ساعة أنسية قدسية فزنا بسر جاء منه عجيب In a sacred intimate moment we attained a wondrous secret from him. فأنالني وأجازني وأباح لي ما لا أؤمل والرحاب رحيب Revolted me, rewarded me, and offered me things beyond my imagination, and the generosity was unrestricted. وبدت لنا فيه مظاهر لطفه إذ كنت أسأل ما بدأ ويجيب. The manifestation of <coughs> of his subtle kindness appeared for us. As I used to ask for what I wished, and he responded. وَلَقَدْ تَفَضَّلَ بِالَّذِي وَلَقَدْ تَفَضَّلَ بِالَّذِي أَنَا عَاجِزٌ عَنْ حَصْرِهِ وَأَنَا إِلَيْهِ أُنِيبُ he bestowed favors that I'm incapable of converting while I return to him. For long had I observed his grace, thus we enjoyed a portion of this pure uh, drink. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Subhanallah. And he says also in another verse, وَالشَّأْنُ فِي هَذَا مَزِيدُ مَحَبَّةٍ إِنَّ الْمُحِبَّةٍ Musibu. Um, SubhanAllah, and that was, as I said, after. Uh, and here's an, another interesting qasida, probably, inshallah, I will send it to you, uh, where he did tawassul by the books of hadith and scholars of hadith. I don't think so anyone has uh, done it before. Uh, it's an interesting qasida. Tawassaltu bil mukhtari khayri al wasaili wa babi dawi hajati min kulli saili. Dakhaltu alayhi bil hadithi wa kutbihi. Wa maqad rawaha min rijalin amathili. Ilahi tawassalna bijahi muhammadin wa bil ali wal ashabi min kulli kamili. Wa bil kutubi al gharai tarwi hadithahu. Wa maqad rawaha min rijalin halahili. Bijahi amir al mu'minina habibina. Bukhariina shaykh al rijal al awaili. Wa jami'ihi al ma'rufi bil sahati alladhi. Tarabba'a fi awji al ula wal manazili. Bi kulli كتاب في الحديث رويته توسلت للمولى العظيم المنائل and he goes and he goes he goes on and on mentioning the main books and the main scholars of hadith and رحمه الله رضي الله عنه just uh, one more question <coughs> inshallah I think uh, this question is probably in everybody's mind uh, tell us something about Sayyid Muhammad's uh, connection with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم <laughs> is there any 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 secrets anything uh, uh, of what we know of his relationship with the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Inshallah, f- th- there are a few things I can mention. We are we, when we are off air, Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cool. yeah, but cool. in general, I would mention uh, probably one or two things. One of them, um, I remember once I was with him and we were alone, and he was in a hal. He was in a spiritual state, and I I, ca- I could see it. So he told me, I am. He, he told me, أنا شاذلي إدريسي علوي إلى أن يأذن لي رسول الله بغير ذلك. I am شاذلي إدريسي علوي. These are like the main طرق he follows. Um, until the Prophet ﷺ commanded me for something else. So he's a, this is an indirect way that this is the, the command of... Uh, and subhanAllah when he used to... Uh, um, whenever... His daughters, for example, used to ask him about uh, seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to smile. <laughs> and he wouldn't respond about uh, anything. But also, not only to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also to the Sayyidah Fatima. And, uh, I think all uh, his daughters, when they get married, uh, are through Ishara from one of those. Yani direct or indirect, yeah. Uh, um, I remember uh, in some of the cases that... Uh, the Sayyid mentioned to, to the brothers uh, who was who wanted to get married to his daughter that he took some time to reply and he said, Oh my son, uh, I wasn't asking about you. I was waiting for the Isha. I was just waiting for the Isha. And he used to, this is what we noticed sometimes. 
he used um, to find difficulties in sleeping, waiting for Ishara from time to time. And he used to keep, to keep beside his bed two collections of poems. One of Imam al-Haddad, rahimahullah ta'ala, and also Sayyid Muhammad Amin Kutubi, who was the main maddah of Nabi Sallallahu in the Hijaz. And he used, this is, يعني, uh, looking for uh, a righteous uh, 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 dream. When he used to, uh, to visit scholars, rahimahullah, sometimes he had the intention to ask them for the tariqah other than the asanid of ilm. And he would, uh, subhanallah, see his father, Sayyid Alawi, behind the sheikh. He would say, or, yes. So before taking, he would he would have a, a sign from his father. Before taking from the sheikh, especially if it was Senate of, of Tasawwuf in, in specific. And um, subhanallah, uh, I was blessed to be with him. Uh, I traveled with him once to Morocco. Uh, and subhanallah in that visit though I wasn't there when that happened but um, Sayyid after because I joined him for four days and then the Sayyid continued and then while he was going back to Mecca he left Fas and he went into uh, uh, Casablanca the flight was from there uh, and they you know they took the boarding everything خلاص, they are flying back and then he said we have to go back I said Sayyid what happened he said, I had a call from Mawlana Idris, Al-Akbar, Sidi Idris. And then, inshallah, I will send you the Qasida. He wrote a Qasida for Mawla Idris, and he replied with a Qasida Mawla. And it's both both of them, inshallah, I will send it to you. Inshallah. So this is what I was kind of, but about, especially the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the, the only one I was exposed to directly. Uh, the other things that Sayyid used to, uh, yeah, and he tried to, mm. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. We've been honored. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. Very spiritual. Alhamdulillah. I'm sorry, you asked me about question. I, I went east and west, and I'm so sorry for that. No, that no. responded just to your questions. We would prefer uh, not to speak, uh -huh. uh, but um, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> Shaykh, um, would it be possible for our attendees, the brothers and sisters who are present here in your presence, to receive a hadith um, from you? that you've heard from Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki al-Makki rahmatullahi alayhi so natabarak inshaAllah we can take barakah from listening Astaghfirullah Sayyidi I will just um, I'm not qualified even to narrate any hadith I will just pass it on as I have heard it from a Shaykh Sayyid rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi um, and it is the hadith al-musalsal bil-awwaliya hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he said ar-rahimuna yirhamuhum ar-rahmanu tabaraka wa ta'ala يرحم من في الأرض يرحمكم أو يرحمكم من في السماء. and I have heard this hadith الحمد لله directly from from the Sayyid رحمة الله تعالى. مبارك الله فيك. مبارك الله فيك. مبارك to the brothers and sisters you've heard this hadith مسلسل بالأولية. Sayyid I'm not qualified to give ijaza or I'm just narrating the hadith of the Sayyid. it's for بركة إن شاء الله. بركة. we've heard this from you. الحمد لله. شيء how many sons did as uh, Sayyid Muhammad have and who did he select from them to be his successor or Khalifa? Uh, the Sayyid, uh, Alhamdulillah, he was blessed with six. Mashallah. And uh, Sayyid Ahmed now, he is the one who is taking um, the position of his father. And uh, Alhamdulillah, he's continuing the mission of the family. So he has resident students, Alhamdulillah. And also um, many students study come and study with him. And he's connected to, he's continuing the tradition. And even, uh, um, you know, he's continuing the, uh, for example, uh, hosting the uh, uh, Zuwar and the pilgrims when they come to the Hijaz, Alhamdulillah, opening the, yani the, the place for everyone. And um, mashallah, receiving thousand and thousand again, Alhamdulillah. Um, so Alhamdulillah, Sayyid Ahmed is, uh, is uh, continuing there. And as we have seen, also Alhamdulillah, he worked on the work of Sayyid and uh, they are printed in such a beautiful way, alhamdulillah. Uh, everyone, if everyone can recite uh, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha once, Surah Al-Ikhlas three times, and at the beginning and the end, uh, Salawat upon the Prophet وسلم, and then whatever you recited, um, do milk of that to Sayyid Ma'an, and then inshallah, he will finish the dua inshallah, and just send all of that as a gift 
to Sayyid Muhammad bin Ali al Maliki, inshallah, and just general dua, inshallah, and for um, our central Jami Muslim goal sheet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to give it success and progression, inshallah. Uh, afterwards, inshallah, please, after, after the program, inshallah. from you نسألك يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أكرم الأكرمين أن تتقبل ثواب ما قرأناه منا وأن تجعله هدية واصلة ورحمة نازلة إلى روح سيدنا وحبيبنا الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله عليه وصحبه وسلم وإلى روح أزواجه وذريته وأصحابه ومن تسلسل من ذراريهم إلى يوم الدين ثم إلى روح من اجتمعنا هنا بسبب شيخنا السيد محمد بن علوي المالك رحمه الله تعالى وآبائي وأجداده ومعلميه ومن اشتغل بعلومه وقراءة كتبه وتدريسها وشرحها والتعليق عليها وترجمتها وكل متصل ومحب وإلى جميع ساداتنا وعلمائنا ومشايخنا ومن تقدم من أبائنا وأمهاتنا ونسألك يا مولانا يا أرحم الراحمين أن تغفر لنا في هذه الساعة وأن تجعلها عليها من أبرك الساعات تعجل فيها الإجابات وتضاعف فيها الحسنات وتتجاوز عن كل الخطيئات اللهم إننا عبيدك الفقراء المساكين الواقفون ببابك فلا تردنا عن بابك مطرودين لا تردنا بذنوبنا ومعاصينا فما لنا رب سواك فما لنا رب سواك فندعوه ولا إله غيرك فنرجوه توجهنا إليك بالحبيب المحبوب طب الأجسام والقلوب إلا ما قبلتنا إلا ما قبلت منا ما تقدم من هذا الشهر المبارك اللهم تقبل منا الصيام والقيام اللهم تقبل منا الصيام والقيام وقراءة القرآن وتقبله منا كما تقبلت يا أرحم الراحمين من المتقين ونسألك أن تبارك فيما بقي من أيام هذا الشهر المبارك اللهم إنا نشهدك أننا قد قصرنا وقد تخلفنا وقد تقاعصنا ولكن لنا أمل في جودك وفضلك أن تتداركنا في الأيام المقبلة فتعيد علينا ما فات يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أكرم الأكرمين ونسألك أن تبارك في أمة سيدنا محمد وأن تفرج عن أمة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم إكراما لسيدنا محمد تجاوز عن أمة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونسألك يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أكرم الأكرمين أن تحشرنا معه تحت لوائه المعقود في يوم القيامة اللهم اجعلنا معه في هذه الدنيا وعند الوفاة وفي برازخنا وفي يوم القيامة وعند وزن أعمالنا وعند عرض أعمالنا وعند جوازه على الصراط وعند قرع أبواب الجنة فإنه أول مأذون له أن تفتح له فاجعلنا معه يا رب يا رب يا رب وفي سجدة الحمد التي يتشفع بها الشفاعة العظمى اجعلنا معه يا رب وعند حوضه يا رب إذا سقى محبيه وأقاربه اجعلنا ممن يسقون من يده الشريفة يا رب يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أكرم الأكرمين لا تخلفنا بذنوبنا ولا تخلفنا بمعاصينا فأنت أكرم الأكرمين وأرحم الراحمين اللهم بارك في هذا المسجد ومن عمره والمتطوعين فيه والملازمين له والمصلين فيه والمترددين عليه وإئمته بركة لا حصر لها ولا نهاية وبارك لهم في أنفسهم وفي أهلهم وفي ذويهم وفي أموالهم وفي محبيهم وجعله يا رب محطا للأنوار والأسرار ومطارا للأرواح الطاهرة بفضلك وجودك ومنك وكرمك وإحسانك واجعل له سر اتصال بمسجد الحبيب الأعظم صلى الله عليه وسلم في المدينة يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أكرم الأكرمين اللهم اجعل أقوالنا من أقوال الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم واجعل أعمالنا من أعمال الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم واجعل نياتنا من نيات الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وارزقنا يا مولانا رؤيته في المنام ويقظه ولا تجعله يغيب عنا لحظة في كل أحوالنا مع الأدب التام الكامل على الوجه الذي تحبه وترضاه يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أكرم الأكرمين 
فرج عن اخواننا الفلسطينيين يا ارحم يا رب تدارك اخواننا في فلسطين يا رب وكل مظلوم من المسلمين في كل مكان تداركهم بفضلك وجودك ومنك وكرمك واحسانك ونسالك بفضلك وجودك ومنك وكرمك واحسانك ان تجعل يا مولانا اخر كلامنا من الدنيا لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم متحققين بحقائق حس ومعنى ظاهرا وباطنا على هذه النيه وكل نية جامعة من خيرات الدنيا والآخرة وعلى ما نويتموه وأملتموه وعلى ما سألناه أن الله يعطينا إياه وما كان من خير لنا ولم نسأله أن يبادرنا وابتدرنا بفضله وجود من يكرم إحسانك والحمد لله رب العالمين بسر أسار الفاتحة ولا حضرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم